We live in a time inundated with remakes and homages to different films, but how do you take those influences but make something original and compelling? This is something that today's guest does really well. Jared Rivett is a screenwriter. He's worked on films like Jackals. He's worked on the series Are You, Are you Afraid of the Dark for Nickelodeon and has also worked on the upcoming Day of the Dead TV series for sci-fi, which drops October 15th. We had a great conversation about his influences like George Romero, John Carpenter, Toby Hooper, and so many more. You're really going to appreciate today's episode of the Film Schooled podcast. And if you do enjoy the episode, be sure to head over to Apple Podcasts and follow the show and drop a five-star rating and review, a written review of the show, to help it get seen by more people. All right, without further ado, here comes my interview with Jared Rivett. All right, Jared, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for asking, Eric. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to have you on. And this show, really, the reason I started is because a lot of shows talk about what are you working on now? What's the newest news? And for me, right. what's really interesting, and it's why I call it film school, is I like to know the movies that made the people that I'm sitting across from and, and uh, you know, Tarantino is interesting, but what are the movies that Tarantino watched? That's the stuff I want to know. Right. And uh, you know, when we talked beforehand, your inspirations really show in your work. I think um, Thank you. you mentioned Romero, Carpenter, oh. Toby Hooper, like all of those things. I, I watched Jackals for the first time last week and <laughs> was, I mean, for the opening scene, you could see it dripping with, <laughs> Carpenter. I mean, with the inspirations, you could see the oh, night totally. little influences throughout the movie. So mm-hmm. tell me about your kind of cinematic birth. What made you? What are the, the early movies that kind of formed who you are? Well, it's interesting because it definitely, um, it all started with Star Wars. Um, hmm. I wasn't into movies. I was, uh, I was, I'm, I'm a little, I won't, I won't divulge my age, but uh, I was born in the 70s. And uh, and Star Wars showed up, and it just kind of changed everything for me. Um, I don't I don't remember what I was into before that. I was probably maybe seven or eight years old, but it just was like, bam, uh, movies and John Williams, you know, scores. I'm I'm, I'm a big score nerd. It, uh, when we initially talked, it was like okay, influences, and I almost put, put Jerry Goldsmith because I'm such a film score nerd. But I was like, no, let's. Let's let's stay on brand. Let's stay to the stick to, to movies because if we go off into film score land, that'll be a whole other that'll be a whole other podcast uh, uh, session. Um, but yeah, Star Wars and and then sci fi fantasy and then it was also I had my parents were not super duper strict about what I watched and it was also at a time they were young and um, we had kind of that golden age of horror that happened right around then. And I don't even know, you know, at the time we didn't realize it. we were just spoiled and didn't know that Dawn of the Dead and Halloween and Friday the 13th and Alien and the American Werewolf in London and all these amazing horror movies were like going to be this focal point of like, we're still in the, you know, I think for decades, we're going to be talking about those movies and, and Night of the Living Dead and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And so these were all things that were, current at the time and I was seeing them and it was like whoa okay and then not realizing as we got into the 80s like okay this was a special little you know eight or ten year span that we had um so it really was kind of being hit by these amazing horror films on top of being into all the nerd stuff the sci-fi fantasy stuff of, of that was huge at the time so yeah it really kind of started with Star Wars and then I would have to say it would be the guys that I mentioned to you, which is Night of the Living Dead and Creepshow, huge. Um, Carpenter with Halloween and The Fog and all, I mean, that whole run, honestly, from Assault on Precinct 13 through to whenever in the, in the, in the 90s. Um, and then Toby, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Poltergeist and Salem's Lot. They just knocked me on my ass. And it was like, okay, well, I, you know, I was changed. And I think the thing that I always say is that creep show is like the big creep show is there's like pre creep show for me. And then there's post creep show for me and like creep show really, I, there was a book um, that came out a couple of years ago and I was, I, I contributed an essay to it. Uh, I was lucky enough to be asked. It was called my favorite horror movie. And basically it was just horror personalities uh, writing about what, 
the horror movie it was that kind of changed them or what was the one that had the biggest influence. Not necessarily like the best. It was an interesting to get a, an idea of what he was saying when he introduced, like, here's the concept of the book. It's like, I don't want you to write about the greatest horror movie ever made. I wanted you to write about the horror movie that had the biggest impact on you. Like, what is mm. your favorite horror movie? And so it was an interesting distinction because it wasn't as if every single, you know, it's like, okay, so what, you, what you're saying is it's going to be, you know, Night of the Living Dead, Halloween, The Exorcist, yeah. Night of the Living Dead, Halloween, The Exorcist. And that's just chapter after chapter. Yeah. So instead it was like, no, which one means the most to you? And Creep Show was the one I think I, I was such a I was a I was a fraidy cat. I was a I was a scaredy cat when I was a kid. I was terrified of everything. Um, and so Creep Show kind of taught me that it could be fun to be scared. Yeah. And it's the tagline of the movie, but it also was, it really did kind of hit me that way. It was like, oh well, I'm having fun watching this scary movie that isn't too scary, but when it scares you, Creep Show, you know, it comes in like a sledgehammer. Um, but it really is more about having fun. And so it's, it's definitely a, a huge Star Wars opened the door to a lot of other things. And then, uh, yeah, I, I think Creepshow would be the one that I would say have the biggest influence. But all the movies that I listed definitely were the ones that definitely, um, you know, molded and shaped who I am and what my style is and what I'm into today. Yeah. What, what was it about the films? Because I'm, I'm always interested in talking with people who because for me it was visuals like i how did they make it look like that person got stabbed how did they make it sure. look like this happened how did they blow this building up or right you know, um and, and so for me it was the visuals but i talked to other people it's the music or it's the yeah. acting you know um what element was it for you that made you go like oh this is kind of magical like when you sat down and watched star wars mm-hmm. was it just the fact that it was a totally different world on the screen what what was it for you I mean, it's first and foremost, it was John Williams music Hmm. for sure. I mean, that's like, I don't even know how much of a percentage, but then you have the first time seeing that level of special effects, uh, you know, being done. And then, I mean, like Star Wars is just a whole package. It's, it's, you get, it's a great story with fun characters and an engaging universe. And then you have fantastic visuals and you have great music. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where everything kind of comes together. Um, and so it really did kickstart my interest in film music and noticing film music. And also at the time, I just thought that John Williams scored every movie. And the weird thing, when you look back on that era, it's like he did so many iconic kind of did. <laughs> themes. Yeah. yeah. And so it was like, and, and so I just assumed when I sat down to see a movie that it was John Williams. And so I think it was, um, Star Trek, the motion picture was the first time. And Jerry mm-hmm. Goldsmith is my all time favorite composer, but I went to see Star Trek, the motion picture in 1979 with my dad uh, in December of 79. And this theme, this amazing theme kicked in. And I was like, Oh, it's gotta be John Williams. And his music by Jerry Goldsmith. I'm like, well, excuse me, sir. Yeah, what do you right. think you would? Well, I, got, I don't know. John Williams. Right. And then it was like, Oh, so there are other guys. There's John Barry yeah. and there's Ennio Marconi and there's James Horner. It's like, Oh, okay. And it just opened up this thing, but it really, I think it's, I constantly listen to film music and I'm the biggest freak in the world about it. And if you're in a relationship with me or a friendship with me, it's like, well, he's going to be listening to film music pretty much all the time. If you go over to his place, there's going to be film music (laughs) playing in the background. Um, It's weird. I get it, but it's just about keeping myself in the headspace. I don't know if I need to kind of be in a movie all the time in order to kind of be a receiver or a, a receptor of the kinds of ideas and the creativity that I need. Mm-hmm. But it's, I think the music listening to the, to film music as a mood and to keep you, I always make playlists. It's the first thing that I do when I'm working on a project, it's the second thing after I decide I'm going to do the project is I create a playlist and you know, that is a, ritual it's a whole that that's a that's an afternoon that's a whole day you know um where i create a playlist it's like this is the right thing that's the wrong thing so that i can just hit you know play on apple music can't call it uh, itunes anymore and um have a mood have a a temperature have an atmosphere uh, of the world that i am going to be writing in and so the music really to me you know, is because you can also, it's not when you, when you separate the, the, the film music from the movie, 
then you don't have the visuals to worry about. Uh, right. And you don't have, it's about a mood, it's about a thing. Uh, sometimes music is really distinctive. Um, there are certain scores that I can't write to. Um, I love Anton Senko's score for Jackals, and we, they put out uh, a soundtrack album, uh, Note for Note Music put out a soundtrack album. Um, I can't use it in any of my playlists because all I get is Jackals out of it. Like, mm-hmm. And that's just, that's just me. But there are other movies, like a lot of John Williams stuff that is just way too specific and distinctive so it's like it's hard to kind of not see indiana jones cracking a whip or superman you know flying uh uh, you know through the sky or um or or or, or the shark from jaws it's like well okay i see brody and i see hooper and i see quint i don't see what it is that i'm working on so like a lot of the john williams as much as i love that's my favorite stuff and i will go see him for as long as he wants to do his hollywood bowl shows and i will buy all of his soundtracks and reissues but um i liked i tend to find stuff that is more of a mood. And I think that Jerry Goldsmith kind of does that. Mm. It's, yeah, and a lot more of his stuff, Christopher Young's stuff, uh, yeah. I think the roster, it's, it, it's, it just, you could keep going. Um, so for me, I guess, first and foremost, it would be the music, but then it's, it's the craft. It's everything that goes into, when you watch a John Carpenter movie or a George Romero or any of these guys, it's yeah. like, there's so much, craft going on. There's so they know what they're doing. You know, you, you are in their hands. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a great book called, uh, eaten alive at a chainsaw massacre. Um, and I have it, but I can't think of the author's name. Muir, John Kenneth Muir, I think. And, um, he, uh, talked about how a Toby Hooper movie was an interesting experience because it's, it's, you, you don't trust Toby. You don't, you, you, as the movie progresses, you feel less and less like your, your guard has to stay up, you know, because yeah. he's going to get you and he's going to get you bad and you don't know how he's going to do it. Um, and I think that I see that when I, when I watch, uh, you know, different kind. I, when you're watching a George Romero movie, it's like, this guy knows exactly what he's doing to get the effect mm-hmm. that he wants out of you. Um, and whether it's something like, um, that, uh, janitor's, uh, rig in creep show in the crate, uh, there's a huge jump scare in creep show. It kind of gets written off now because we've all seen it so many times and it's, it's, it's so old and if you're, you're seeing it with an audience, but there's a bit where Hal Holbrook first goes to the university to check on Fritz Weaver's story to see if it's true. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of nerd. He's there alone and he's nervous about looking under the staircase. And so he's doing this thing where he's kind of looking, but he's not looking where he's going. He's constantly, he's got his eyes are riveted on the gap under the stairs and he's looking and he's looking and he's looking and he's leaning and he's stepping and he bumps into this janitor's rig, this, this, you know, wheeled cart that has a broom or a mop on it. And the broom handle makes this huge noise and if you see it in a the theater, and Romero had said, and I saw it in one of his interviews, he said, it's the biggest scare in the movie. Hmm. It's a two-hour movie with five different stories in it and a wraparound. And the biggest scare is a broom handle yeah. tipping over because the audience isn't expecting it. And um, so when, but you know that you have the audience in the palm of your hands when something like a broom or a mop handle <laughs> <laughs> falling, making a noise, gets the audience to jump. Um, and that sequence too, that whole, I mean, the crate is probably my favorite part of yeah. the show. But, you know, when Billy shows up and Henry realizes that the story has worked and that she's fallen for this whole bullshit thing about Dexter Stanley and the girl under the stairs, it's like, and he can't, cont- he's, he's so giddy about what he's about to do and he's so amazed that it's worked that he starts to laugh and he can't control himself and it's hysterical and i just love i mean that's a genius sequence and so you see the craft that these guys pull and i mean carpenter and and toby they all definitely all i mean i love all the masters all of the all the masters of horror masters uh guys because you just knew that you were in the hands of people that were going to manipulate you and scare you and you know tell a great story perfectly 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, they are masters and, and that's oh, yeah. where, you know, you hear the term master of horror and you hear the, and, and the conversation always, you know, as much as earlier I was recording about James Bond, who's the new James Bond, the conversation, who's the new master of horror gets thrown right. around so much. Is it James Wan? Yeah. Is it Mike Flanagan? Are the, and right. talented directors, you know, but it's, it's like, it's too early to tell. Like you look at the careers of a carpenter, Romero, Hooper, mm-hmm. years of just consistently creating interesting things not always perfect movies you know there's yeah. there's flawed movies in hooper's career and carpenters and romero's uh, i'd argue romero has the least uh i think <laughs> movies that don't work i think all of them work for me on some level oh god um, absolutely but it but absolutely. it's you know they were expert filmmakers and the other piece of this and this is why you know when someone tells me there are three or four inspirations i'm always trying mm-hmm. to look at what are the similarities you know and and mm-hmm. i think carpenter romero and hooper I'll have that expert level of knowing where the story is going, but also too, one thing that resonates with me with those films is there is a handmade quality to all three of those filmmakers do yes. mainly to budget. I mean, you look at Halloween or you look at, especially with Romero's movies, um, even the one that just got re-released amusement park or Toby mm-hmm. Hooper with eaten alive, you know, it's a very, right. you can see the, almost see the wires of yeah. the movies. Um, yeah. And for me, as someone who's interested in filmmaking, someone who's interested in creating, I love that because it's yeah. attainable. There's some yeah. attainable level, like not maybe the craft or the storytelling, but the mm-hmm. way that they put these films together. So what was it that motivated you to say, like, I want to get in the business of making movies, not just consuming. Like, I want to start putting these pieces together. I, I, it's so far back that I honestly can't remember except that... I like I said, I became fascinated with movies in general and how how did they do that? Like you said, how you you know, I, I have a special effects book that um I bought uh and that I got when I was very young. When because that's the thing, when Star Wars blew up, it was all about special effects, like yeah. there were books were and magazines stars. and Starlog <laughs> and what's yeah, ILM doing. You know, yeah. Exactly. And so like and the thing was like I said, I was I was a Frady cat and Fangoria was this kind of gateway to understanding or at least beginning to understand how they did those things. So it's like, okay, well that scalping and maniac, like I can't even look at it as terrifying. Did they scalp something? Did they really do that? Like, no, no, no. Here's how they did it. You know? And it's like, Oh, okay. Well then now that I know how they did it, a, I am less afraid of it and more fascinated by it. And now I'm again, uh, fixated on the technique on the craft that's being, you know, uh, uh, put up on screen, visualized. And then it's like, well, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could, you know, and then just wanting to tell stories. I was also uh, started to, in a real formative part of my life, there were a lot of horror anthology TV shows and movies, a lot more than I think before or since. We're in a kind of a renaissance period right yeah. now that I'm really excited about. There are a lot of them, again, but there were so many. And I think that not only are you 100% right about that, I didn't even really consciously think about the fact that Toby and John Carpenter and George Romero were, in fact, all kind of, you know, grassroots guys. And I mean, Romero, I'm an East Coast kid. I'm from Massachusetts. And all yeah. of the East Coast horror fans, Romero is a god. Like, yeah. there is no, because it, and it's an uh, American movie, right? Where Mark, uh, I can't think of his last name, but you know, he was like, oh, here was, a, you watch Night of the Living Dead. And it's like, there are, it's cold out. There are dead trees. Like, this isn't Hollywood. It's not, it's it's kind of amateur. It's got this feel like it was shot someplace that I recognize. That cemetery is, I used to ride my bike through a cemetery that looked just like that. And so you, you felt a connection with it. Same with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Same with Halloween um, and the fog. And, um, so yeah, you really did feel kind of a kinship with those guys, but with the the horror anthology thing to get back to that, it really was something where I was fascinated by the kind of short bite, like the idea that you could, I, I guess it felt like, oh, it doesn't have to be a big epic thing. It can be something that's 10 minutes long or 20 minutes long, uh, you know, and you have a good scare and you don't have to, you know, um, I'm a big fan of Amicus uh, uh, horror anthologies. So, mm. you know, the original Tales from the Crypt movie from 72 and 
from Beyond the Grave and uh, and those movies, Asylum. And one of the things that they kind of, uh, Milton Sabotsky and uh, his partner, they talked about was like, it's hard to maintain a horror concept for two hours or for 90 minutes. Um, so why not just do these little bites? Because if you've got a crazy idea for a horror story, it's like, well, that's great. But can you stretch that out for two mm. hours? Are you really going to have them go and look in the library to figure out, you know, it's like, or do you just have it have something happen, you know, and then you're out and you move on to the next one. And so I think that that made it even more. I was really obsessed with anthologies, still am. Um, I was really obsessed with anthologies back then because I liked the idea of the short bite where you could get in and get out and scare the crap out of people and people would be super duper impressed. And I didn't think that there was, I don't think there's an action movie equivalent. I don't think that there's a romantic comedy. I mean, maybe there are, but it was the idea. And I'm not even like a shorts guy. I'm not much of a director when it comes to visual stuff. I write and then I do audio dramas that, and I do anthologies, um, but uh, I think I'm intimidated by all of the work that goes into directing. Yeah. Um, but so it's not even so much that it's about like, oh, okay, well, I can do this in a week or a couple of weeks and then be done as opposed to the months it would take to, to do a feature. Um, so yeah, it really was being kind of raised. So for me, it was things like Tales from the Dark Side and Tales from the Crypt, the HBO series yeah. and Monsters and Amazing Stories and Alfred Hitchcock Presents the, the 80s iteration and the Twilight Zone, the 80s uh, version. Yeah. It was nuts. I mean, there was a time, somebody on Twitter the other day was like, you have to realize there was a time where like this, all of these shows were on at the same era. Like they had seasons, live yeah. running, first run seasons in the same calendar year. And it's like, your brain yeah. explodes because it's like the idea that they had Twilight Zone, the new Twilight Zone, Tales from the Dark Side. And they Side, weren't small these shows. Were, these were like, yeah. I mean, you look Huge. at you look at Tales from the Crypt on HBO and you, mm-hmm. you look at the people behind that show mm-hmm. and it's amazing now. Like it's like Saturday Night Live of Horror. It's like you look at yeah. every single guest on Tales from the Crypt, they're huge stars. Um, yeah. They either were coming out of being huge stars or they were about to be huge stars. So you've got, I mean, first of all, you've got like Richard Donner producing the show. Who's like right. at the and peak Zemeckis. of his game, you know? Yeah. And then you've got like watching the show, you've got Daniel Craig in one of the episodes, you know, before yeah. like layer cake. I mean, pre yeah. anything, Daniel Craig, you've got Christopher Reeves, mm-hmm. you know, hacking meatloaf, like the singer <laughs> meatloaf into right. pieces and serving him. You've got Arnold Schwarzenegger directing Arnold Schwarzenegger. an episode. You've got, so much talent and yeah. did all of them work? No, but it's amazing seeing how much money was getting poured into these projects and yeah. it, it, how big that genre was getting for a period of time. And I do, I think we are, we're in something of a, it goes in an ebb and flow. I think like, so you've got, That's you had the nineties really strong. You had that very early two thousands, you know, where it was, you know, it started to die down and got very cliche with like the late nineties, early two thousands. Then you have a James Wan with saw and you have for what, for me, I grew up with saw and the, the platinum dunes remakes, which I have a very soft spot in my heart for like Texas. Chain. My introduction to Leatherface, Jason, Freddie was platinum dunes, you know, and you know, love it or hate it. Like it's amazing seeing these big budget, B movies get put up on the screen. It was, it's amazing. And now with Blumhouse, like I'm so fascinated to see where that train ends up. You know, we're in a very interesting time period. The whole thing is way more mainstream than Mm -hmm. it's been my entire life. When I was a kid, Fangoria would get me in trouble. Like having an issue (laughs) of Fangoria would get me in trouble with my grandmother or, you know, with whoever. Um, I mean, you even just buying them. I remember like the covers being an issue where they would literally have to like keep them behind the counter or they would have to put a brown paper (laughs) uh, slip over them and they wouldn't let you see them. Um, So no, it really is amazing to me. And I think that you look at... um, uh, Walking Dead. I think you have to yeah. thank, you know, Walking Dead for making. I and and uh, I have had nothing to do with with Walking Dead at all, really, directly in, in any way whatsoever. In point of fact, I wrote a zombie script just before Walking mm-hmm. Dead that got me a lot of attention and got me signed by an agent uh, by a big agency. And I had people reading my script, and you know, it was like a zombie script. It was big, and then Walking Dead happened, and I felt a little upset about that. 
Um, but I can't deny that the impact that that show has had on the culture and on horror and the idea of like NC 17 level violence. Gore, very good. I mean, I, I mean, George couldn't have gotten away with some of that stuff. I mean, the episode, what's crazy about walking dead is you have kids watching walking dead. Yeah. Like when that show came out, cause I think it started I'm trying to remember the year it started. I was in high school yeah. and I was just into, I had just gotten into Romero. I had just watched Dawn of the Dead. It was one of the first horror movies that I had ever really pursued. My first horror movie was Psycho at like 12. You know, we didn't watch horror. And then I went to, what are classic horror movies? I watched Dawn of the Dead. Wow. Like me and my friends would talk for hours. What what would you do if there was a zombie apocalypse? You know, it became (laughs) part of our dialogue. And then my friend comes in and says, have you seen Walking Dead? What's Mm -hmm. that? He's like, it's like Dawn of the Dead, but it's a show. And it right. just keeps going. And, you know, watching that with my family Sunday nights, like we get home from church <laughs> mm-hmm. and then you sit down and you watch, you know, Guts episode three or four. And it's like they're <laughs> cutting up zombies and smearing guts onto themselves to blend in. It's like, what right. is this? And this is primetime <laughs> TV, you know, that all of America's watching. It's, yeah. it's absolutely crazy. You it's know? huge. It, it's like, I mean, those, I, I don't know. I don't think they're still at the numbers that they were at, but there was a time three or four seasons it was the biggest show where it was yeah. the biggest show on television. Like Seinfeld. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's zombies, you know? Right. It's, it's insane. So I really do kind of think that general, and I love that we're here. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, in terms of work, in terms of my interests, I mean, there's nonstop flow of great yeah. stuff to watch and there's still subversive stuff. There's still stuff on shutter. That's like way, you know, yeah. it's like, okay, well you think that walking dead's intense, like, okay, well then there's this where they're doing horrible things. It's like, wow. Okay. This is really great. <laughs> so there's still, it's still subversive. I feel like, but it's also super duper mainstream. And I feel yeah. like it's a gateway uh, to other things uh, for horror, um, you know, watching, but I, I really have to kind of, I can't deny that walking dead, just it really, I you know, and I think there's a lot of you know, saw the saw movies definitely becoming yeah. that torture porn era, uh, becoming a big thing that was a communal thing to go every Halloween, right. to go every October. Oh, it's if it's Halloween, it must be saw. Um, so I feel like generationally speaking, those things uh, uh, definitely uh, have made it way more mainstream, way more mainstream than when I kind of broke in. Which you know, arguably, has anybody broke in? Did I ever really break in? Um, but when I sold, I, you know, the, that, that script and, and uh, got signed and was looked like it was going to be a big deal for 10 seconds back in the mid 2000s, I was going in on all those things. It's what you blow out the Platinum Dunes things I pitched on some of those didn't mm-hmm. get them. Wow. Uh, a lot of the remix. It was a fascinating time to be in Hollywood and in uh, horror because you would write something, a feature script, a feature spec script that would impress people, um, you know, for doing something daring, for doing something interesting with the concepts like, oh, we've never seen that, you know, a zombie thing done that way Mm -hmm. or a possession uh, concept done that way, Uh, whatever it was, haunted house done in an interesting way. And then you would give it to your agents and um, your agent would send it out every place and you'd get a thousand meetings. And the meetings would be all about, we have this movie that we want to remake and we, we would like you to pitch to see if you want to write, you know, write it. Uh, we have this J horror movie that uh, we own the rights to, and we want to remake it. We have this comic book property and we want to, you know, and so it was, I mean, and I, we're still there. I mean, that's never going to change. I don't think um, IP is still King no. in, uh, in Hollywood. And I, I think more so it's just getting kind of worse and worse on that level, but it was a really interesting thing to kind of come in with two or three, you know, scripts that were, you were trying to do something different. You were trying to do something new and then being asked to just kind of do, you know, well, here's, we want you to remake this. It's like, really, do we need a remake of that? You know, and here's the guy here, you're talking to the guy who did, are you afraid of the dark and and day of the dead? So it's like, well, okay. Like clearly I'm a sellout, but you know, but it really was an interesting kind of time where all that we were getting in the platinum dunes era were big time hollywood companies that were paying big bucks to make big budget remakes of like the hills have eyes which by the way great remake yeah fantastic oh. remake yeah. um one of the few that might be better than the original i mean I, it's arguable yeah. i but you know i think the crazies might be better than romero's original as well um i love the crazies remake i think it's fantastic but like the hills have eyes and the crazies super duper subversive horror films from the 1970s, like yeah. made by 
that weren't guys blockbuster who were hits. Establishment. Yeah. No, you know, they were driving things that made you know, the crazies is kind of B-side. You know what I mean? That's not even yeah. Hills Have Eyes is like, well, okay, that was definitely drive-in circuit material. Um, but yeah, it was interesting to me that once that started, it was really Texas Chainsaw Massacre that kicked it off. Um, and I've worked with Marcus Nispel on a couple of projects oh, that have yeah. not. I, it's funny because I've worked with Marcus Nispel on a couple of projects and I've worked with Toby Hooper on a couple of projects oh. that none of you know them came to fruition. But it was really interesting because I got to know them in this era. It was really, you know, yeah. Marcus had done Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We were both at the same agency. And um, and then it was the one-two punch of Texas Chainsaw and then the Zack Snyder, Dawn of the Dead remake. Yeah. And then the floodgates opened. Yeah. Everybody just started buying, you know, whatever it was to the point where they're doing Assault on Precinct 13 remakes. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it's crazy. But, like, anything that those guys touched, anything that they did, whether it was Piranha or, you know, <laughs> yeah. or the crazies. It's like, well, for the crazies, I, I'm trying to think if there was something I went in on where I just kind of said, like, guys, nobody knows this title. Why is it so important? Like, it was something where we, uh, I went in with a director, we were pitching a project, and it was a remake of Christmas Evil. And it was That's in the a, Christmas. I love Christmas Evil. Oh, so I good. Love it. I, yeah. Amazing. An amazing yeah. movie. If, if your listeners have not watched Christmas Evil, Christmas is coming up. You will love buy the Blu-ray, buy it, and watch it seventeen times because it's such a great movie. Um, but uh, I remember. But it's also like nobody knows it, and that wasn't even the original title. It was yeah. actually released as something else. It was released as I think, uh, and all through the house, or yeah, uh, I can't remember what the original title was. Um, uh, now I'm like stuck on trying to remember what the original title was, but anyway, um, but it was weird. And I remember kind of fixating um, on, I, I, we, it didn't end up working out. There was a rights issue anyway with the, 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 whoever it was that owned the rights to Christmas evil was actually not, uh, not selling, at least not to the producers that I was working with. And so I remember kind of saying, well, why don't we just do, cause we had our, our, our pitch was really different anyway. It wasn't, it was going to be a really far afield remake of christmas evil and um we just said why don't we just call it like the 12 deaths of christmas or you know come up with some other kind of fun scary yeah. title and they were like yeah it's the ip we really just wanted the ip and it was like wow like we'd worked a lot on the pitch we had worked uh, really hard and had some really inventive stuff in it um but they just were like, no, it was just IP. So like there were things. And then I, I've been involved with projects in that era that I worked on for free. And then the rights fell through. Yeah. The negotiations for the rights fell through. Um, I worked on two different remakes of Hell Knight. Wow. The Linda Blair slash yeah. from 1981. Um, two different iterations that both times they were killed by the rights well, being an mean- issue. A lot of these movies that that and all of the ones we're mentioning, I mean, even really, you know, Nightmare on Elm Streets, and you know, I mean, it was a big hit, obviously yeah. for New Line, but I mean, look at Hills Have Eyes is better example. Sleeper hits, you know, VHS in the '90s, they became like gold. It was like right. this movie, like I Spit on Your Grave or Christmas Evil. Christmas Evil, mm-hmm. like, I mean, Shutter kind of put it on and like that kind of rediscovered and it's an yeah. amazing movie like legitimately oh. good movie the performance in okay. that is amazing like it's on par yeah. with like i think like a norman bates you know and psycho i mean it's fantastic um, totally and it gets you know? crazier and crazier as it goes like yeah. I, and the, the last I shot of that it. movie i oh. won't spoil it for people i haven't watched it but like it's, but it's one insane. of the best endings oh. of the film easily and you know, so you look at these though, and then you get the rights from people remaking. It's like some guy owns it, like some guy in yeah. Long Island owns yes. the, the film right. print. You know, and right. so it's funny, like when these films try to get remade, it's like easier to remake Friday Thirteenth because there's something. Well, not now; it's a bad example. Um, <laughs> but it's, other, I mean, that, that clearly is going to get better. Yeah, you know, but but again, even that yeah. though, it's because they were such small movies. Like a contract right. wasn't a legit contract, and there's all right. these problems. Right. Yeah. I got to I got to ask you um mm-hmm. as much as I want to talk about Marcus Nispel cuz Texas uh-huh. I'll just say Texas Chainsaw 2003 is phenomenal and and oh, I great. loved his his work on that and Danny like, Pearl coming back and just proving he still got it. Me too. Um I got to talk about IP because this is something sure. that came up uh, I interviewed BJ McDonald recently uh who mm-hmm. did Hatchet Hatchet 3 and mm-hmm. we talked about paying homage to past projects and he talked about how much he loves the 80s um i don't think that's mm-hmm. an uncommon sentiment right now nope. um but he said you know 
the world's kind of saturated with people trying to mimic that look, but not really yes. hitting it. And, right. you know, it is right now trendy, to, you know, Wonder Woman 84 or uh, creating shows that are set like Stranger Things, which, you know, I got burned out on, you know, kind of doing that aesthetic. Sure. How do you, you've taken, are you afraid of the dark? Mm-hmm. Jury's out on you know, how we all think about day of the dead. There's no right. pressure there, but you know, how do you, <laughs> we're never going to make people fan? happy on that, by the way. <laughs> how do you, I'm sorry. Go ahead. As a fan approaching this IP that matters to you, day of uh-huh. the dead, Romero, yes. that matters to you. Are you afraid of the dark? Yes. You're coming in it with love of anthology and creep yes. show and all this. Yes. How do you step into that? Make it fresh and new, but not feel like you're just laying into the value. The IP already has like just basically cheaply taking it like, like, say, for example, you take Night of the Living Dead and release as an mm-hmm. anime movie and just try right. to capitalize on it. How, yeah. how do you not do that? I, and it's, it sucks because a lot of, I mean, that's, I'm, I am, I'm as upset about animated Night of the Living Dead as a lot of people online are. Um, and it sucks because we're being, Day of the Dead's kind of been lumped in. I feel like there are these articles right now where it's like, and so it's like insult to injury is the animated Night of the Living Dead. And oh, by the way, uh, yeah. there's this awful sci fi channel Day of the Dead thing that no one's seen yet. It's like, how can yeah. you say it's awful? Stephen Kostansky directed the episode that I wrote. Like, how yeah. like, are you kidding me? You got to give this thing a chance. Um, but we're never going to make those people happy. I'm like, we, they're never going to watch it. They're going to hate it sight unseen. And then hopefully it'll find its own audience. And that's yeah. kind of where I'm at because we did. We poured, we have some really solid writers on that show. And it was a lot of fun. We had a great time going through it. And, you know, the idea, so the, it's funny because Are You Afraid of the Dark and Day of the Dead almost had kind of different mandates. So they're both kind of different examples. So in Are You Afraid of the Dark's case, it really was about making sure that we brought back the mood and the, that we were respectful and brought the show back. Mm -hmm. Um, Nickelodeon didn't want to do it as an anthology and until we were done and they were like, okay, well now it's going to be the, um, uh, uh, the American horror story equivalent of an anthology, which Mm -hmm. is that every season is going to be new, um, which kind of sucked for us because we were then like, well, I, then we're out, we're not doing it anyway. And I only worked on the first, the first season with Ben David, uh, Ben David Grabinski, who was the writer and the showrunner. Um, and it's important for me to point out that he wrote all of those episodes. I was the staff writer. And so I was basically the sounding board and we worked creatively, you know, kind of hand in hand on developing, uh, the concepts and the the plot lines for all the, all three of the episodes. It was an event series that was in 2019. Um, but that, that was really about making sure that we hit everything about the midnight society and, you know, um, how they operate. It was like, okay, well, let's deconstruct this. Let's make this about them on a level where it's like, okay, in 2020, you know, in 2019, where, where is the midnight society now? And our idea was that it never stopped, that it was that it kept going. It evolved. There are probably chapters all over the world. There's probably different, you know, places that you probably have like a kind of a, a fight club kind of, you know, high sign that you would know when you were in town, if there was a, if there was a midnight society. And so, um, but we really did like one of my jobs on Are You Afraid of the Dark was to kind of go back and watch all of it before we started. Tough job. Um, and, well, <laughs> no, and it was, great, yeah, yeah. you know, and the, so here's the interesting thing. So, and I, I had my own little personal journey on Are You Afraid of the Dark was really interesting because I was, I'll just flat out say it. I was too old for Are You Afraid of the Dark mm. when it premiered, when it came on, when it was on, I was in my twenties. Yeah. So, as much as I am a horror anthology guy, I was too old for it. It was, it was a show for kids and I was already, you know, well out of high school at that point. So it's like, I was in my twenties. Um, so I didn't really, I'd seen a couple episodes, but I didn't really know the show. Um, I never had any kind of negative opinion of it. I never was like, Oh, that kid stuff. It was just like, I just, our, our paths never really crossed and yeah. it made sense demographically. I was not the right guy for it. Um, it was geared towards a younger crowd. So when I got the job, which was a total like lucky thing, I said the right thing at the right time and, and mm. got, got that, that gig. Um, and I had to jump through some hoops. I had to prove myself. Um, I really didn't know anything about the show. I had vague kind of cultural knowledge uh, of it. And so they said, okay, look, we want you to come on, but we really need you to be, you know, uh, steeped. We need you to be the guy that, that stops us if we're going too far down the wrong road. 
So I uh, bought the digital version and, and uh, you know, I had to kind of, the digital versions are not in order. You have to actually, I had to do all this research as to like which episode came next and where it was in the volume three, volume five. Like it's so bizarre. They, they don't have them set up chronologically. So I sat and I watched them and I took notes on every single episode and I, became, I fell in love with the show. And I was amazed as an adult how great the show was, how solid it was, how scary it was, how atmospheric it was. And budget wise, I still am mystified how much that original show must have. I don't know how much it cost, but watching it, it's impressive as all hell. I don't know how they afforded to do some of the things that they did on that show. So I am becoming a fan of it. I also do uh, horror trivia, monthly horror trivia uh, out here in Burbank. Uh, we're kind of on hiatus right now because of the COVID stuff, but but we 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 do that. And so people started to find out, you know, it became, it was publicized. It's like, okay, Jared's involved with the show. And we have a real varying age range. We have, you know, older folks that come that are, you know, and I mean, they're into horror from the 70s and the, and the mm. 60s and the 80s as well, but they are also, they're into the universal stuff. They're in the older stuff. But then we have kind of my generation, and then we have kind of this next generation. We have people coming that are in their late teens and 20s to, to every event, and um, which makes it challenging, by the way, because you really do have to know like everything yeah. about everything to, to, to <laughs> ask questions and be an expert so that you're not, if they catch you, then you're screwed. Like if, if as soon as you they realize that you don't actually know what you're talking about, you're dead. So what happened at some of these events as the are you afraid of the dark thing started to really pick up and the get publicized and get announced um i had younger people coming up to me and saying dude you're working on are you afraid of the dark i was like yeah like and they were like no you don't know like that was my gateway drug that was that's what got me into horror and like they're a screenwriter now or you know they're mm. they're an actor now who is like invested in horror like huge fans it's like, oh my God. And then I realized, and I've talked about this with Ben David too. It's like, oh man, this is an important thing that we're doing. And I'm going to treat it that way. I'm going to be the, you know, the, the custodian, you know, of this. It's, I'm only going to be involved with it for sure. I would love to continue to be involved with it, but this is the short, this is the short little time while we're working on this. And Ben David had the exact same thing. This is the most important thing. Are you afraid of the dark? Doing are you afraid of the dark right is the most important thing in our lives hmm. for this, this period. And it really was, and it was so much fun to work on. And it was so much fun to not only kind of dip back into their mythology and like I said, kind of explore how, because that was one of the things that the show, the show did it later in, in, in the, they, they had their own kind of secondary revival season that, that came out and they did have kind of this uh, big uh, mythology, um, no. uh, multi-part episode. Um, but we wanted to kind of show it, you know, like I said, from 2019 and say like, okay, what is it now? And, and how do you get in and how do you do this? And um, we were kind of bummed that we couldn't do the anthology thing because that was the format we're like that's the format we kind of said like that's kind of the show guys like you know and then it's like well okay do you not want to do it like no 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 we want to do it but it yeah. really was like you know either it's a narrative story with characters that run through multiple episodes or you're not doing it so it's like okay well then we're going to make the best of this that we can and so ben david ben david was a fan ben david's a, a little younger than me and he was that was his gateway drug mm -hmm. to horror and so it, it, it was just kind of getting the right guys to have the love and the, the, the care to yeah. make sure that we handled that material um, the way that we did. And um, I, I've, the reaction was great. It's probably of the things that I've had my name on, I think it's the one that's had the best positive reactions. Mm. Um, Jackals is kind of 50-50. Um, and, uh, but I, are you afraid of the dark definitely is something where I have, you know, people still reach out to me and cause the people keep rediscovering it just, it just popped up on Netflix for the mm -hmm. first time. 
uh, on October 1st and I had a bunch of new reactions. That's the fun thing about streaming. Yeah. I'll get people that just watch Jackals as though it's brand new and they just, you know, they, they reach out to me, they'll, they'll DM me or they'll send me an email or they'll reach out to me and be like, Oh wow. I just saw this thing. And it's like, yeah, that was like, I did that like 2015. Like it's, it's really old for me, but sure. You know, great. I'm glad. Yeah. yeah. So it's like streaming being something where people are discovering and a lot more people are seeing, are you afraid of the dark right now? Which is really exciting to me. Yeah. Um, but it really was about, um, you know, the, the love and respect of the original show. Now, Day of the Dead was interesting because that was a legit, um, I occasionally work with a writing partner who's named Wilder Konchak and he and I were, uh, he's a comedy guy and I'm a horror guy. So whenever we, whenever we both have kind of horror comedy ideas, that's when we work together. And, um, we had heard that there was a Day of the Dead series, uh, that was moving forward and a lot of times by the time you hear these things like in Deadline Hollywood or in the Hollywood Reporter, it's, they're it's already put done. together. Yeah. It's already put together. It's like they've already shot, you know, the pilot or whatever. Um, maybe even if it's just done and you're just hearing about it as though it's a new thing. And so nine times out of ten, you see these things and it's like, oh, man, you know, interview with a vampire is a series. Hey, hmm. agents, look into this for me and find out if there's, oh, they're already, that's already closed up. They've already got a staff. So I just assumed it was another one of those. But it was like, oh, Day of the Dead. I mean, like, my God, because that's the thing, like, I. Yeah, we're going to get, we're already getting a lot of, you know, shit from hardcore fans. I am the biggest Romero fan that I know. And so it's painful to me to see yeah. the stuff that without, again, sight unseen, but we went in, we got the job and the first thing, and I was, uh, you know, Scott's, uh, uh, Scott Thomas, uh, and Jed Elianoff are the two, the showrunners and head writers. Scott is just as big of a horror fan yeah. as I am. And their whole the what they sold the show on was the idea so you know you have to now again i didn't sell the show i'm not the showrunner so i don't exactly know what um it's the same producers by the way that do creep show uh, mm, okay, uh for sure. and, the new yeah for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it's this company called the cartel and a couple of other it's the same it's all the same when you look at the credits like the deep credits you know, the executive producers and all stuff it's all the same guys that do creep show mm. um i don't know you know creep show gets a pass but we don't but anyway um, so they went in, they must've been, uh, Jed and Scott, they went in with a pitch and the idea was that they must've been hearing, you know, the cartel guys and the rights holders for day of the dead must've been hearing a lot of different pitches. Now to me, when you're going to do day of the dead as a TV series, what is it going to be? It's going to be walking dead. It's going to be the show that's been on mm -hmm. making, you know, so, okay. So that's already been done and it's still being done you know there's still there's all spinoffs and, and yeah. you know whatever the case is and people are so, starting to get burned out on that style. Burned out. yeah it's like okay well so i'm sorry but if you're going to make a tv series out of day of the dead it's going to be walking dead so they went in and they are kind of comedy guys who have also they did the banana splits movie which oh, is insane if you haven't seen it um and so they are coming at it from kind of a horror comedy perspective almost more of a return of the living dead yeah. type of thing and so they came in with this pitch that was more of a horror comedy that was a little bit more kind of like let's mess with this a little bit let's do something different yeah. why is why is respecting george mean that you just i mean i think that some fans would say well you just don't do it just don't don't do it at all but it's like well but it was a gig and so they said look they went in they pitched their horror comedy version of day of the dead which, by the way, is kind of a literal interpretation of the Day of the Dead. It's basically like 24. The show is all set. The entire first 10 episode season is set in one day. Oh, interesting. The Day, the day of the Dead. That's um, a great concept, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Exactly. So, like, they said, we went in, we pitched. It's like, it's this crazy small town, and it's day one of the day of the, of, of the zombie outbreak. And we're going to do things a little different and we're going to do things a little crazy and we're going to do things a little over the top. Steve Kostansky style, who wasn't involved with the show when I came out, but when I found out that they got him, wow. I was like, oh my God, that, that's wow. perfect. This is perfect. Yeah. And he has his composer on. I mean, like, it's going to be really cool. So people are kind of writing, you know, writing it off already, um, which bums me out. But at the end of the day, it was like, okay, so do, so what, what Jed and Scott said was, do we not take the job? Like it's yeah. the same thing. Like, are you afraid of the dark? It's like, well, okay, you want to do it as an anthology. We don't. Are you leaving or are yeah. you staying? Um, so this was a situation where it was like, well, they called them up and said, we love this 
concept. Write a pilot and start putting a staff together. And it was went straight to series, by the way. It was not something where they had to make a pilot and then kind of, you know. Um, so they had a 10 episode order out of the gate. So it was like a real rush situation right when COVID started. We was all Zoom. We did the entire writing staff was done via Zoom. It was done like this. So um they said, Do you not do it? Like, and it was like, well, no, like A, it's a job. Like it's running a TV show. It's running a horror comedy TV show. Yeah. Like, do you realize how big this is for us? They do stuff for, for Nickelodeon, coincidentally, and, yeah. and for Disney Channel and things like that. Um, so like the idea that they got this job, it's like, okay, well, we're going to do it. And we know, and we had multiple conversations about how it was going to be. Now, this is back in, I think we started in March or April of 2020. Yeah. Um, and we went through uh, June, I think, of, or July writing. And I was involved with my with with Wilder, uh, my co-writer. From we we developed the entire season. So like when I say that we wrote episode three, that's the script that we were assigned to write. But we worked on the whole show. Um, and the one I mean, one that I had a lot of that I have I feel a lot of authorship of is episode eight because that's the I, I really feel like I kind of started to click and get really into mm-hmm. like oh let's do this let's do this let's do this. Um, but it was an interesting experience, you know, to, to have a, a, a Zoom only staff, uh, you know, writing. But um, so we all worked on it together and you had, you know, uh, horror people in there like me and Scott. And then we just had great writers. We had um, the writer of Idle Hands hmm. uh, was on it, Terry, Terry Burton. Um, and so, you know, we had some fantastic people. So it really was again. And, and I was, again, the horror expert guy. So there would always be and Scott and Thomas and I. So there would always be this like, oh, we want to do something like this. And I was like, well, we've kind of seen that in this. We've kind of seen this, you know, like, oh, we should avoid that because, you know, this other movie or this other TV show has done it. So kind of being the zombie expert was was right. one of my roles. But it really was about kind of taking the original Day of the Dead, the elements of the original Day of the Dead, and doing something different and fun and cool and kind of crazy with it. Um, so it was entirely different as a as an upfront mandate than Are You Afraid of the Dark, which was, you know, make it exactly like bring right. back the feeling of that. Well, it's it's a huge responsibility. And I know yeah. you're aware of that, you know, as a, as a horror fan. Day of the Dead is is my favorite Romero movie. Romero is my favorite director. I mean, yes. there's nobody who I mean, there's nobody like Romero to me, um, you know, and even social issues, even the way he tackles. I mean, I could say anything that's already been said about him. I mean, it, it, to me, you know, if Romero is God, I mean, day of the dead is the Bible. I mean, like he, <laughs> is, he yeah. to me, that is the peak of his, his talents, Savini's talents. Lori Cardell mm-hmm. is the best character in any of his films. Mm-hmm. Rhodes is the best villain in any of his films. Bub is the best yes. zombie in any of his films. I mean, it. That movie to me, Greg Nicotero working on that movie with, you know, right. it is a masterpiece. You know, and in John yes. Harrison's score, you want to talk scores? Uh, my favorite yeah. horror score is that. I have it on mm-hmm. vinyl. I mean, like me I too. love that. That. Oh yeah. That um that soundtrack, you know, yep. just that boop, 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 all flying in is like, <laughs> yes, yep. let's go. Oh, it's fantastic. And, and best, one of the best jump scares, the hands to the wall. The first time I watched that movie, I was like, holy crap. Like what yep. in the world? First two seconds going uh-huh. into the movie. So yep. coming into it, you know, when, when I first heard it was announced, I remember whispers of it when it first got announced that we're going to do it. Cause you know, screen rant and all them are running like, Oh, it's going to be a failure and planting those seeds. Right. Yes. And, for me initially, I was like anybody. I'm like, why? Like that's the one. Don't touch. You know. Like I right. love remakes. Like I'm okay with it. That's like I said. That's how I get introduced to so much. Then Day yeah. of the Dead. I'm like, that's the perfect movie though. Like don't sure. touch that. And right. then you know I started thinking and I was like, you know, okay, well maybe it's going to be like the script Romero wrote, which ended up kind of becoming Land of the Dead, where it's going to be right. the full scale government. But then I was like, well that's that's The Walking Dead, you know, Walking and. Dead. And I'll be honest. So then I watched the the trailer, and I mm-hmm. really enjoyed the trailer. Setting aside, I was like, "This is interesting. This is kind of the style." Stephen um, Katansky, like, yeah, Leprechaun Returns is, <laughs> is like I haven't seen The Void yet, um, which I, uh, I hate to uh, admit. check Stephen it out. Katansky with Leprechaun Returns, 
I've yeah. watched that movie so many times and I've, I've probably recommended that as a new horror movie to more people. Yeah. And it, it, it was a sci-fi original movie. It wasn't yes. a theatrical, it, but the gore is amazing. The performances, mm-hmm. Pepe Sanuga in that movie is so good. Mm-hmm. And I have like a little micro fandom just for her. I mean, she's so good yeah. in all the horror movies she's been doing. Yeah. And it's just, it was, it was excellent. So him being involved made me comfortable with the tone Mm-hmm. And then with you, you were somewhat of an unknown. I was looking at people working yep. on the show. I was like, I got to talk to a writer on this because <laughs> I got to know how you tackle the inspired by George Romero. Angle, right. Um, which I was yeah. happy to see that too. Like the inspired by, it gives you a lot of license. Yeah. But looking at you. So I, I watched Jackals for the first time. Right. And I'll, I'll take a second just to hype you up. But <laughs> I, I watched Jackals maybe four or five days ago. And okay. My wife comes in. She's like, I hate this. This is terrifying. She left the room. And, but I watched Yay. the opening scene, walking up, uh-huh. petting the dog, um, you right. know, putting the mask on, the right. Reagan picture on the frame, yeah. like all these touches that are like very intentionally written in. I don't know if that right. was just you or if that was a mix of the director making choices, but I was like- both. I watched it after booking you. So I, I, yeah. I had in my mind Carpenter, Romero, Hooper. Yeah. Yeah, he's like, well, Carpenter. Obviously, this opening <laughs> totally. scene is Carpenter, and this is clearly right. written to be a Carpenter homage. The Reagan yeah. on the night sounds like there's a little Romero already happening with the prayer, the Christian family saving someone yes. from the cult. Right, and then right, you've right. Got, you know, a Night of the Living Dead siege movie mm-hmm. happening in the backwoods, a la Texas Chainsaw Massacre with a mast. You know, and it and right. then got like these weird, strange, you know, Toby Hooper esque torture porn elements happening. Yes, you know, in yep. the middle. And so for me, I was blown away. Like I, I was expecting kind of like the, the strangers, you know, my wife even said, she's like, is this kind of like the strangers? And I was like, I'm not a fan yeah. of the strangers personally. Right. Um, but I want, I was just like, this is incredible. Like, it's incredible that this evokes all of this cinema that I love and mm-hmm. all of these old films that laid the groundwork for movies like this to exist, but it's yeah. its own thing. Like there's yeah. not, when I look at jackals, I don't go like, oh, that's like, a Halloween ripoff or that's a right. Texas chainsaw. It's very distinctly its own thing while also being an amalgamation of, of many things. So thank you. Watching that wow. watching. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. You know, the good, good work <laughs> thank on you that. so much. <laughs> um, but it is, it, it really is. And, and, you yeah. know, with that, with Steve, like who he's somebody that I'm just, I mean, like I said, Leprechaun Returns, like it's just a well-directed movie. Oh uh, yeah. And it, it's, it, you know, seeing those two things together, I mm-hmm. feel very comfortable now, whereas mm-hmm. like a few years ago, I was going to be like, <laughs> right. screw Jared Rivet, whoever they're right, right. in, why is totally. he watching this, you know? Totally, totally, um, totally. Oh, no, but, yeah, but who the hell am I? But when you look at the work, it's like, this isn't a cash grab. Yeah. Here's, the, here's the thing. Here's the point I'm getting at is that the studio is going to make Day of the Dead anyway. Mm-hmm. Anybody mm-hmm. who has that IP is going to make it. It's guaranteed yep. to make money either from hate watches <laughs> or yeah. people who are passionate fans. And they have been, by the way. Like, yeah. we're, oh, we're like my a God. Fifth, oh, we're the fifth oh my God. spinoff, I've, you know, revision, reimagining. I've watched Day of the Dead, Dead Contagium, okay? Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. done my time. <laughs> I watched uh, Mina Savari in uh, Day of the Dead 2008, uh, which Jonathan I'm sure she's Sheck. great, but the movie is... Jonathan- Jonathan Sheck, the lead from Jack, one of the leads from Jackals, is in. That's, he plays the bub, the, the yeah. kind of new. Bub oh, in the new in, one, Bloodline. Yeah. The new one, yeah, right. which I I avoided watching. Like, yeah, no, they're so, yeah. they're gonna do it, and it's like right. it's like for me, I feel at ease now. When I watched the opening scene of Jackals, mm-hmm. I I literally was kind of like, okay, <laughs> I feel comfortable <laughs> that this person's taking on because there's so many people that are doing. Again, Stranger Things, I burnt out on right. after the first season because it was like, here's your favorite scene from this. Right. And it's like, that's not it. it, it it's, right. it's, you know, here is what you love. Right. Let's take it in a new direction. And it, yeah. I think for me, that's what I'm kind of expecting from Day of the Dead. I, I want to ask you, you know, and maybe I'll be calling angrily in like seven days, you know, or three days. Uh, but I got to ask you for my audience listening, because I know there's yeah. people listening who are going to click and go like, let's see what trash is going to say about this to make us more right. mad about this. Right, 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 right. You know, for people who are sitting there going like, here's what we, you know, what can we expect? Blank slate. Tell us what this is going to be. Uh, what can people expect from the series? You know, dropping the 15th. I mean, it's coming it's really quick. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm excited too. Um, and uh, it's it's not. 
about, you know, uh, uh, George Romero did the masterpiece version. Why mess with the version? Like, it's mm. exactly what you said. Um, we're doing something different. We're doing something fun. We're doing something that is a little bit more uh, return of the living dead in a kind of small town um, on day one. And it really is over the top. It really is, you know, Stephen Kostansky style. And again, did not know that he was doing it when we originally yeah. started on the project. Um, but once they said that he was involved, it was like, it just all clicked to me. It's like, oh, okay, this is going to be fun and scary and gory. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but it's going to be something that is inspired by George in the best way, which is that if, if I'm inspired, you, you saw Jackals, if I'm inspired by George Romero, I'm not going to just copy, yeah. you know, we're not the animated Night of Living Dead. We're not just going to copy what he did. We're going yeah. to be inspired by it and build on it and maybe take things in new directions, which, you know, I don't know that, you know, I, I, have, I, I will not be the guy, don't, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, no. He said that, you know, George Romero would approve of it. I don't know that he would or he wouldn't. I yeah, don't know sure. that he would be upset. I, 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 you know, I, I don't think he was very happy with Walking Dead. I don't think that he was very happy with any of the stuff that was done to his work. Well, you he's know. an auteur. I think, I think he had his very distinct vision. Yeah. And I think he and he was very kind, I think, to Greg and, and Walking Dead and, totally. and, and all that. And, yeah. and even to um, Zack Snyder's remake, you know, he said it's a fun roller coaster ride for what it is, but it's not what right. I would have made, you know, and I think that's right. a fair, it's a fair yeah. thing, you know. And if it weren't for the Dawn of the Dead remake, you wouldn't have gotten to make Land, Land of, the of the Dead, gotten a yeah. $15 million yeah. budget yeah. Totally. to go right. crazy, right. you know. Yeah, you know, so that's absolutely so. I mean, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's we we worked really hard on the show and we worked really hard to create fun characters that you hopefully will want to you know watch how they keep dealing with the situation and like i said the day the, every episode basically being kind of an hour of a day or or you know mm -hmm. it's kind of it's loosely defined because it's not 24 and we only have yeah. 10 episodes so it's like well okay it's not 10 hours of a day it's you know it'll it'll get dark eventually there'll be episodes that will be set, set at night um, mm -hmm. but it's mostly day day of the dead um so it's just it's a crazy zombie variation that I hope people will give a chance to because we're doing some things that I personally haven't seen before hmm. in a zombie show. And, you know, if doing it because the rights holders of Day of the Dead wanted to make a TV series out of Day of the Dead and they let us make this, then it's like, then I feel like it's, it's, it's justified itself because it's yeah. not just copying or ripping off George. I think that we're the opposite of yeah. the Night of the Living Dead animated uh, movie because it's like they just took and they didn't even credit George. It's yeah. like, that's terrible. We're, we're you know, I, I think that the ad people are putting George a little bit over, you know, on Day of the Dead's ad stuff. It's like, okay, we get it. Like you're trying, I think they're trying to kind of make sure that we're getting some it of the Romero fans. To homage, you know, yeah, to yeah. But we're trying to, you know, trying to get them to at least respect the idea that to at least watch the show before you destroy it. Um, but I am so, I, I had a great time working with people that really, I mean, it changed the way that I write things and the way that I work on things for the better. Mm -hmm. I feel like a better writer since I worked on Day of the Dead. Um, and um, I think it's just going to be a lot of fun and something that people, if they let go of, you know, uh, where where is Rickles? Where is you know? And we do. We have characters. We have we 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 have characters with the, with the names, and we kind of they're. I was going to ask if Rhodes was going to be similarities, right? There's Rhodes, and, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, we we have that, but we're doing it in kind of an interesting way where there are equivalent characters. Um, so it's going to be uh, fascinating to watch, especially for me, as I don't know where I would be as a horror fan on it. I think I would be, I would probably be dubious, but I would also give it a shot. I would also yeah. at least watch it and see what That's I thought of it. Everyone but talking to, trash is going to watch it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, have to let it, it go. And like you said, we really are in this era where you have so many reboots and so many remakes and some of them are, you know, straight up just kind of doing it again, but some of them are great and you have to give them all a chance. So I'm just saying, you know, out there to you guys, give us a chance. You gave Creepshow a chance, uh, yeah. you know, give, give Day of the Dead a chance. 
um, because I, I'm super duper proud of it. And I mean, I, I think Steven's, you know, like you said, Leprechaun Returns. I, I love Leprechaun Returns. I loved it's, it's so like, good because yeah. I'm a fan of the franchise. I actually really like the Leprechaun movies. And um, I went back and looked at them not too long ago. I got that the Lionsgate Blu ray mm-hmm. box set, and I was like, okay, I'm doing it. I'm going through and I'm going to watch them all, not in one sitting, mind you, but you know, over the span. And um, I was fascinated by the idea. This is pre Stevens sequel, pre yeah. Leprechaun Returns. Um, I was fascinated that they had never made a direct sequel. That yeah. he's he's Trimark, Vidmark. They had this thing where like the Warlock and the Wishmaster and the Leprechaun, where every movie they were basically like a new character. Yeah, like the Leprechaun in two isn't doesn't have the same backstory yeah. as the Leprechaun in one, and they in one of the later sequels they actually like oh the Leprechaun is this guy and it's, it's like, an anthology not, of sorts. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's weird. I mean, it's, it's always Warwick Davis, and he's always got the same attitude, and he's always got the same you know kind of uh, you know um, uh, at you know he's he's his line delivery and everything. It's like well, it's the same dude. Um, so I was always kind of fascinated. The only thing that bummed me out was that they couldn't get him to come back. Yeah. but I thought the guy they got was great. And I love that it was a direct sequel. I love that they went back to the house and they brought back the actor uh, from the first one. I mean, so no, he's great. And if you haven't seen PG Psycho Gorman, uh, you got to watch it. It's insane. It's a movie made by and for insane people. Yeah, right. And it's so gory and so nuts and so fun. I mean, um, I mean, Leprechaun yeah. Man, like the the the, the scene. Because I, 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 I mean, sci-fi was hit or miss, you know, for me, like on a lot of okay. stuff for a while. I think they took a while to find who they are, and I think they're actually yeah. doing a lot of interesting stuff, like Channel Zero, and you know, amazing yeah. now, yeah. very interesting, amazing original content. I think for a while they were like, "Are we just the Sharknado people? Are we this?" Right. And and um, and man, like the sprinkler into someone's head and like spraying the blood. And I was like, who made this? Like, what is yeah. this? You know? And yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited. I mean, like he's somebody that I'm just fascinated by. I think he's someone to watch as well. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm really interested to see what he does next. And, and me too. you know, me too. it's, it's just, there's so many creative people again, like I, I'm, I'm sitting here, you know, I feel at ease, like I'm ready, you know, and also, it's like Leprechaun in a sense in, in that, you know, WWE didn't exactly drop the mic when they took on the Leprechaun series, you know, right. Um, right. and same oh, with hey, Day of the Dead. I mean, mm-hmm. the bar is low right now for remakes of Day of the Dead, you know, right. it, Day of the Dead Contagium, you know, Day of the Dead uh, Bloodline and right. Day of the Dead 2008. I mean, yeah. all really missed any point of what it is, you know, yeah. and, you know, I, I'm excited to see where this goes. I think people that watch it, I think are going to be excited about where it goes. And, and like I said, I mean, even if it doesn't, I mean, it just makes me feel better whenever this stuff is in the hands of fans, you know? Yeah. And and that's where, you know, I mean, there's directors I can think of right now who've taken on even original projects where it's like, I'm just happy I'm supporting them. <laughs> you know, like I'm right, happy I'm right, supporting, like even, yeah. even going into the Halloween, you know, like I was, yeah. I was following shockwaves and listening to Ryan Turk. And I'm like, even right. if Halloween sucks, I'm so happy <laughs> Ryan gets to make this movie, you know, because yeah. it's like, that's awesome. You know, like so, it's cool. Uh, Someone who's a research fan wise, is, research wise. I don't know if you know this, but Ryan Turk and I used to be roommates. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, we were oh. best friends and roommates. We're still friends, but uh, we used to be much closer. But uh, yeah, we were <laughs> roommates. Um, yours hey, Ryan, uh, would love to have you on the show. There you go. Uh- <laughs> yeah, no, Ryan. Um, so no, it's been wild to, uh, we both had our own kind of trajectories, but it's been wild to kind of watch him kind of, you know, go through the success. Become what, levels. yeah, I mean, I, look, I, and here's where I can say too, like coming, I'm 26, you know, like I came into horror, I'm, I'm a baby. I'm a, I'm a horror fan baby. You know, I've, I've been doing my homework. Okay. I've been working yeah. on it and yeah. going back and, and, you know, like I said, now the majority of the movies I watch are pre eighties. I mean, pre nineties, like it's, it's, right. it's getting to learn this stuff, but I look at people, you know, look at people like you, look at people like Ryan, look at people like, you know, Steve Catanzi and, and they're creating again, the responsibility, you know, I, right. I think of, shockwaves you know when it was running in, the, in that podcast and yeah. and i would be sitting there going like i love this 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 and this and then right. i would sit and listen to them say if you like this you need to go listen or watch this yep. and you know uh 
this is kind of a personal story, but like I went to, I drove to LA for Friday night frights to watch Texas mm-hmm. Chainsaw Massacre one, two, and three on the big screen, Caroline oh, right. and everything. Yes. And, um, and I just remember like out of the corner of my eye, seeing like Ryan Turek yeah. over yeah. just off to the side. And then, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm like, and then Caroline Williams is there who yeah. like Texas Chainsaw Massacre two is my favorite Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. It's so weird oh, and crazy. Fantastic. Yeah. And, I just remember thinking like, it's so cool seeing the generations of horror Mm -hmm. passing it on. And then you see the guy, you know, running the event. And then like a few weeks later, it's like, Oh, he's getting to do a Sonic movie. And he has like this massive budget, you know, it's like, yeah, Josh, it's just, yeah, it's just so cool. Yeah. Yeah, Josh Miller. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just cool seeing all of that play out, you know? And then it's exciting too, because I'm seeing people, in my bracket that are now making movies. And it's like, there's so many layers and so much history behind all of these projects being made. And it's just yeah. cool seeing now, if now is an era of anything, it's right. like the era of like fans getting to pay tribute, you know, like yeah. that's really exciting to me. And that's what, yeah. for me, I'm, I'm excited. Like even the license plate in the trailer, it's like GAR, you know, it's like right, right, that's right. so cool, you know, like that, <laughs> right. those little things that just up, a studio just trying to cash in isn't going right. to take the time to do that. You know, it's right, really, right, right. really no. special. And I agree with you. So Josh, Josh and I are really good friends. Josh is in, um, Hey Josh, come on the pie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh. No, Josh is, he's, he's a great guy. Um, Josh was in my, uh, tales from the dead of night. Uh, first, the first earbud theater episode that I did, oh, I'm, wow. I'm working on that right now. I'm working on tales from the dead of night two, but, uh, tales from the dead of night one for earbud theater, uh, which is something I'm, I'm going to pimp. Um, but, uh, he was in the first episode, uh, uh, in the second segment, it's an anthology. It's very much my creep show. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a three story anthology and he's, he was, he plays one of the leads in the second. Uh, oh, story. wow. Amazing. Um, but he and I go way back and uh, another great guy. And I mean, how good was Sonic? Oh, yeah. Like oh, I was, God. I couldn't uh, believe it. Yeah. I, I was. Yeah, because I didn't know who Josh. I met Josh Miller at Friday Night Frights. I'd never been before. Yeah. I just saw it promoted, whatever, and was like, I gotta go see Texas Chainsaw yeah. on the big screen. Like, duh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and my yeah. friend drove. I think down. I was at that screening as well, by the way. Oh, you were there? I think so. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It so sounds we, familiar. My friend and I drove down from. I live in Southern California, so he drove from Fresno. I drove from like Banning, California, like near Palm mm-hmm. Springs. Go there, like sit in the movie, and then like I was going getting food right before, and like I'm talking to this nice guy there, and yeah. then like he gets up on the stage, and he's like, "Hey guys, I host Friday Night Frights. Yeah. I'm Josh Miller." Oh yeah, and then and then no like, airs, huh? No airs at all. He's he is down to earth guy. Anybody? Oh yeah, no. I just, he was just like, "How's everything dude. going? Do you like everything?" And so uh, I was like, "Yeah, cool, whatever." I love Josh. And then. You know, and then like literally a few weeks later, it's like, oh, gets the Sonic movie. I was like, what? They got doing the Texas Chainsaw, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and the trailer drops, it gets hate, and then the movie drops. And I watched yep. it with my daughter. I was like, this is freaking amazing! Like, this yeah. is so good, so well written, such a creative yeah. take on it. Like, but again, it's fans. You can just tell. Like in yep. Sonic, you can tell that someone that loves that property, and it's somebody that loves, <laughs> like they Absolutely. love movies. You know, there's yeah. just so much no. fun in it. I couldn't believe, I mean, you know, I know we're not going to talk about Sonic the Hedgehog for, for another hour, but, but, but honestly, yeah, sure. I said, honestly, <laughs> I was blown away and I am the guy that always says, you know, I'm, I, I've got the chip on the shoulder about video game adaptations and I'm always like, mm-hmm. they're never good. They never make, they have never made a good video game adaptation. They've never, you know, where is the video game adaptation, uh, you know, uh, uh, equivalent of Shawshank Redemption? Where mm-hmm. is the video game equivalent of Casablanca? Where is the, you know, and so it's like, it's always crappy like you know and, and sometimes yeah. they're okay you know sometimes they're yeah. they're all they're all right but there's there's never a great one and i think sonic kind of broke through and i know that anybody listening to this is like like that hasn't seen it is going to be like no. you got to watch it i mean it's, it you really have is. to watch it is so much better than you could possibly expect and yeah. i can't wait they're doing the second one they're working on the second one and i, oh, I can't I'm wait so to excited. see it yeah i can't I'm wait excited. so yeah so that was an, a fantastic i think that was the last movie i saw before lockdown in a theater mm. i went josh uh had he was like hey guys we're going to burbank uh, uh here's the screening here's the here's where we're sitting and we all went it was this, this so big cool. coming love fest where we went and we couldn't and you didn't have to lie afterwards yeah you didn't have to come out I mean, afterwards and be like lighting was good <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah exactly yeah you know and find some specific little thing to talk yeah. about so that you wouldn't have oh. to tell him that you hated it. it was like no oh my god you made a great video game movie that yeah. is fun and has a lot of heart and, and it's I, deserved I was, 
you're yeah. sitting there as someone who's worked and gotten it and it's deserved. And yeah, no, totally. And man, totally. I, I'm, Great I'm excited. I, I, I really am pumped for it. I'm excited to share. I'll, I'll sure I'll write you an email once I, once I watch it on, on my thoughts <laughs> yes. on it. Um, I'm, I'm really excited. This is one of my, again, favorite, I mean, it's my favorite Romero movie. It's, it's, you know, Laurie Cardell in that movie uh, to me, I mean, on par with a Ripley or, I mean, it's just such a it's powerful, pre -Ripley. powerful movie. Yeah. It's pre Ripley. That's yeah. the thing that always blows me away. And people, I saw it in the theater, uh, my mother had to take me because it was, it was, uh, unrated yeah. and it was, you know, no one under 17 without, uh, you know, um, what yeah, a cool think mom it, to take Oh, she was great. Yeah, yeah, she's great. She's great. And yeah, she took me to Day of the Dead because it was the thing. It's like we were both, she and I were both huge fans of Night and Dawn. And so mm -hmm. it was like, hey, hey, because I, I was 85. I would have been, you know, 13 or 14, I guess, 12 or 13. So I was way too young uh, when that came out, <laughs> summer of 85. Um, and, um, but I was sneaking into R-rated movies. You know, I was yeah. already, you know, kind of well versed in just kind of, you know, getting in uh, however I wanted to. But this was like, okay, well, A, this is really important. Like, I really need to see this movie. And B, yeah. there is this like, we will not allow children. And so my mother had to kind of come with me as opposed to just dropping me off. She had to actually kind of come with me. She was excited to see it. And um, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I fell in love with that movie instantly. And even though it wasn't at the time, you have to realize it's kind of like Texas Chainsaw 2, Day of the Dead at the time was kind of rejected by yeah. the audience because it was ahead it was of like, its well, time. Yeah. It was a way, yeah, both of them, both super ahead of their time and great movies. I feel both of them, but Day of the Dead was so interesting because the people turned on it. They really did at the time and it wasn't embraced until, I mean, there were the hardcores loved it like me, yeah. you know, loved it on day one, but it took a while for it to gain. I mean, George uh, Romero did interviews where he said, yeah, there was this one critic that said, if, you know, I saw Day of the Dead. If they drag every single print out to the middle of town square and make a bonfire and burn it, maybe someday we'll forget what the flames looked like. And it's like, that was the reaction. And he couldn't believe it. he was heartbroken because he, it's, yeah. it, he's to, to his dying day said it was his favorite of yeah. the zombie movies. It's, it's a master. It is a oh, it's an amazing movie. And Bob Howard movie. Sherman as Bob is incredible. No. Um, everything about that movie from start to finish, performances the writing the music um i absolutely adore and yeah this it's a tom savini like i said it's a tom savini showcase so i mean mm -hmm. i absolutely love the original day that and have loved it since day one but it was really interesting that it took years yeah. uh, and a lot of those guys that's the case it's like with carpenter with the thing or you know they make a great movie and there's a couple of people at the time that are like yeah i, I went and saw it and it is great but everybody else you know, either rejects it or it gets you know yeah. completely trashed um, so it's interesting to kind of come around years later and see that night, dawn and day, it's like people, I, I always have a hard time. Which one's my favorite? I don't know. It depends yeah. on what day it is. I love them all. I put them all on all the time. Yeah. They're a huge influence on me. They're a huge influence on my work. Like you said, you could tell, you can see it yeah. um, in, in Jackals and you can see it in the other stuff that I do. Uh, and creep show creep show obviously has a big impact, but I no, mean, that's the jackals, thing. Yeah. them arguing in the house, you know, right. So right. night living dead. It's like, do oh, we yeah. go to the cellar? Do we give him over to them? Do we right, do right, this? Right, right, it's right. like, it's like, you're literally looking at the conversations happening between Dwayne Jones right. and everyone else in the house and I living dead, you know, and, and right. Oh, totally. You know, totally. That, and that was the thing. It was a huge impact. I mean, and it's tough too with that one. I mean, this is a whole other tirade, but I'll, 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 I'll rattle these off with jackals. Um, you were talking about the eighties kind of burnout, uh, when I wrote, I wrote Jackals in 2000, I originally wrote the draft in 2006, uh, finished it in 2007, started shopping it around. Toby was going to direct it. Toby Hooper was originally <sighs> attached to direct it. Um, and, um, it was set in the eighties because mm. it was, and it wasn't, it's funny cause there were reviews that basically said like, oh, it's set in the eighties. So they don't have to worry about cell phones and they can, no, it was set in the eighties because the satanic panic and the practice of culty program. programming yeah, yeah. were only in the eighties, only in the early eighties, the culty programming thing got really dangerous and people started to get sued and arrested because they were basically kidnapping people against right. their will. And, you know, so, but I had this concept, which was like, okay, what if a culty programmer took someone out of one of these supposed satanic cults that are out, you know, because in the eighties, we were all terrified if you were walking home from school, that a van was going to pull up and drag you in and you were going to be taken out to the woods and, and sacrificed to, to ball, you know, or whoever. Um, and, um, so it was this fear that was being perpetuated by, you know, the media and by, by the news. 
And it was something where it was like, okay, well, this is kind of prevalent and it's, it's never gone. It's kind of like the bomb. It's kind of like nukes or something like in the eighties, we were terrified of satanic cults and we were terrified that, you know, Russia was going to nuke us into oblivion. So it's like, okay, I figured out the deprogramming thing and the satanic panic thing, put them together. So it has to be set in the eighties. It's like, okay, well, that's great because that removes the clones. It removes the internet. It, it, it makes them more secluded. I can do something more like what George did, what John, you know, there's a lot of assault on precinct 13 in there. Um, and also at some point realizing that Toby was going to direct it, it became very Toby Hooper-ish. And so there were things that kind of ended up in there that were very much. So it was more about, so it was written before the strangers came out. It ended up being directed by the guy who edited the strangers. Kevin Greutert mm-hmm. was actually the editor on the strangers. Um, so we got a lot of shit for that in a weird way too, which was like, oh, this is a ripoff of your next and, and it's not strangers. anything it's like, close no. thematically at all, with no. the exception of the. I could see like the mask, you know. Sure. But again, like, okay, so was every horror movie where they have a mask? Right, <laughs> the right, 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 and, exactly. And, no, because I watched it and I was like, people in reviews would say stuff like that, and I would look. I was yeah. like, okay, so it's kind of like the strangers. I don't really like the strangers. I, I right. personally, I like I said, I, it doesn't hit for me. Um, sure. I don't think it goes far enough in what it does, and it 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 just has a lot of just downtime, which Jackals doesn't have. I think right. Jackals blows strangers out of the Thank water, you. like story wise. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's um, but it really is like it it's it's just strange people laying that on it when it's not yeah. in the same, I would say it's much more if you're going to say, Oh, it's, it's taking heavily from something. Like for me, it was night living dead. Like I saw yes. more of night living dead, even yeah. the hands coming through and the chopping. on. I was mm-hmm. like, this is all night living dead. Like this yeah. is not strangers. Right. Like this is homages to that, but it's also, <laughs> like I said, its own thing. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you really quick what, on yeah. the on the cult deprogramming thing, have yeah. you seen the movie Faults by any chance? Yes, with Leland Orser. Okay, I just yes. need to ask. Okay, I got to. Yes. That's it. <laughs> that was my no, question. No, <laughs> I have seen it. Um, so it was interesting. Once again, script was written in two thousand six. Mm. Um, Toby was attached to it, and then uh, and and that didn't work out. Um, a couple other directors. It's it's one of those scripts that just it's like my reps and I always were like, it's going to get made. Like this is going to happen. Like nothing that keeps attracting the kind of producers and directors that keep kind of flirting with doing it because it would always die out. And I would always get depressed and they'd be like, dude, like this is going to happen someday. This is going to get made. And so at one point, um, Darren Bousman was attached to the director, wow, yeah. which was an interesting, uh, uh, time. Would have worked, and, I think during that time. Yeah. Period, for sure. So yeah. here's a weird little story. I originally had, the opening scene of Jackals was not the POV uh, uh, in the house sequence. It was the parking lot of a grocery store where uh, Jimmy, uh, Stephen Dorff's character, and Jonathan Sheck and a couple other guys in ski masks, which got written out of the script, um, are in a van waiting uh, for, the, for Justin with his fellow cult members to come out with supplies that they're going to, that they're going to bring back to the cult and they wait and they see him coming out and you know, he's got the bags and he's completely unsuspecting and they kind of blitz. They, they come in and they open the, the van door and they go rushing out with guns and with the, the ski masks and they grab him and they hit him on the head and uh, drag him into the van and then peel out and drive away. And Darren, um, and that's that scene got me in a lot of rooms that scene got me in a lot of meetings. Like everybody was like, wow, like I, all of a sudden, like I can't breathe. Like I'm, I'm on page three and it's like, holy shit, like what is going to happen in this script? So Darren uh, originally was like, you know what? I think you should cut that scene. I don't think we need it. And I had a big fight with him about it and he won the fight and we took it out of the script and it stayed out of the script because kind of Darren's version kind of fizzled out. And then the producers on Darren's version kind of segued into being the producers that eventually did make the movie. So it was like, Oh, well, this is the version of the script. And I was like, can we put that scene in back in? Can we put that scene back in? Oh, you know, do you need it? And it's a grocery store and there's people around and you get a parking lot like this is going to be really expensive. And then I saw faults uh, and faults has a scene yeah. where she's in a grocery store <laughs> and there's, he's in a van and they rush in and really, you know, rough grab her and throw her in the back of the van and drive away. And I was like, hey, guys, you know, this whole thing I've been fighting you on about this scene with the, yeah, yeah, forget it. Never mind. We don't need it. 
but you know, so I'm not crying foul at faults. I think faults is actually a pretty solid movie, um, yeah. but and I was very different, kind of, very, and very different. different. Oh yeah. They're very different movies. But again, it came out, you know, my script was floating around a lot. Like my script got, yeah. like I said, it went from producers and directors to more producers to more directors. Um, and they do nothing like uh, jackals at all. They do no, they don't do anything that jackals does, you know, other than yeah. that, there's a culty programmer at the, at the that's center. Really it. That's like, the yeah, that's really it. Between the but two. if, if I had had my way, we would have had the same scene. Like that scene, the way that it plays in faults is almost kind of shot for shot what was in my original script. Uh, and so I was a little kind of, uh, like, huh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Because it is like the cat, it's, it's the inciting incident for faults. Like it's the yeah. first thing that happens too. So it's like, hmm, that's interesting. But yeah, it definitely. So we decided to, uh, to kind of not go in that direction. But I thought faults was great. And yeah, I, I uh, there's a couple of culty programming movies that, um, and now I'm completely blanking. Uh, Split Image was probably the biggest. Uh, Split Image was directed by Ted Kocheff, who did um, First Blood it's from 1982. And um, James Woods plays the, it's James Woods in Videodrome era. So it's not, you know, yeah. James Woods now. Uh, Brian Denny, he played the dad. And um, Karen Allen was in it. Peter Strauss, not Peter Strauss, Peter Fonda was the cult leader. And um, it's a drama about deprogramming it's not a horror movie yeah um, i watched one that was i forget what the time period was but it was like a kind of tv movie mm-hmm. um it was just like deprogrammed but it was very much just played beat per beat what it would be like it was based on the lottie moon cult and everything and right and, uh, right um that's the thing it was so disturbing back then back I remember then it was like this could happen movies. to you tomorrow yeah <laughs> but there was know. something so kind of like um almost like a horror movie because it was almost like an exorcism and it was really like emotional and something where it was traumatic on a psychological level to everybody involved. Yeah. And so I found it that that stuck with me. It always stuck with me. And I always was like, well, you know, maybe there's a way to do a horror movie version. Maybe they're possessed. Maybe they're possessed by the devil and you bring them in. And I was like, no, 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 take it down a few notches and don't have it be Linda Blair with the head turning. Let's do something else. Yeah. And so, yeah, it really was something with the culty programming where those movies definitely left a lot of an impression on me. But the rest of it is Assault on Precinct 13 and The Fog yeah. and Night of Living Dead and, uh, and and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I was heavily influenced in Texas Chainsaw 2. And Toby knew that. Um, I remember at one point, Jackals opened with a crawl, uh, an opening crawl about the satanic panic and yeah. about, uh, you know, that, that era. And um, <clears throat> day one, uh, Toby meeting on the script script meeting with Toby. Um, we went through, we're going through page by page. We're going through page one, page two, and he's talking about, okay, so what is this? And why is, why is this happening? And what is this? You have those meetings. It's interesting. If I, one of the things I always say is that if I'd known that I was going to be called to task for every single comma and period and decision that I put on paper, I probably wouldn't have gotten into this business, but, um, but you do. So you sit down with the director and it's important. I mean, your director, you, you need to know that you're on the same page and like, okay, well, how am I visualizing what this other person has written their vision? Yeah. And how it has to be adopted. It has to become their vision. Then they have to put their imprint on it. And so we had a cult deprogramming. It was a satanic panic kind of thing. It was just kind of the history of really brief history with a crawl that went up the screen, you know, and I would hope that they would get John Larroquette to do it. And yeah. um, I, he, so he said, why, why is there this thing at the beginning? And I said, you're like Toby. I said, yeah, (laughs) yeah. I said, well, it's kind of an homage to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And he said, Jared, do you know why there's a crawl at the beginning of Texas Chainsaw Massacre? I said, no. He said, the movie came in too short and we needed to pad the running time. (laughs) That's so funny because it's such an iconic. It's iconic. Yeah. Right. But again, it's that handmade thing where like you see these things happen where it was just pure like Day of the Dead being in the mines was like an afterthought, like, oh, what other location can we get? You know, like, right, because he's written this huge epic thing. What it's known for, you know, it's It's hard to understand. That's that's been an interesting lesson. And it's something that when as from going from being just a fan, I'm still a fan. And so I still watch movies and still have the same reactions that, that everybody does. But there is this idea when you're a fan, when you're a hardcore fan, that you look at a movie and you try to say, but like, oh, but then you wouldn't, if it weren't in the mind, then you wouldn't have this and this. Or, or if it would, you can't imagine it any other way. 
And the weird thing is that when you're working on a movie and when you're working on something like Jackals, where there was going to be a Toby Hooper version of that movie, it's like, no, no, you have to realize at one point there was an entirely different version of this that was going yeah. to happen. Um, so, yeah, like The Mine and, and Day of the Dead is a fantastic example because you do have that that sprawling Land of the Dead-ish. Mm -hmm. It was different from Land of the Dead, but it was you know, he took a lot of the same elements. It was bigger than Land of the Dead. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a massive it was, yeah. scale apocalypse Huge. now zombie right movie. right 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 with the multi-tiered class stuff because i love social commentary i i'm you know mm. jackals is full of so if, if you're looking for social commentary jackals is full of it that a lot of people i feel like kind of get missed they didn't really oh, I mean, like you said the reagan picture on the thing oh. and the yeah. um and the uh in this house we pray or or i forget what the yeah. thing i was like oh it's it's very poking fun Yep. in a very light way at certain things just yep. on the sur and, just on the surface right there and then it and gets establishing deeper. time and you know so it's it's when you can do as long as it's not i think the thing with social commentary that's fun and it's it's such a tightrope walk because you can make the subtext text accidentally and you know people groan it's like oh yeah. they said the thing out loud that i'm supposed to be kind of getting from and so you try to kind of so when you when you have a picture of ronald reagan it gets a laugh i've seen it you know mm -hmm. I've, I've watched it with with an audience and uh believe it or not and and ronald reagan picture always gets a laugh but it tells you when this is at mm -hmm. least loosely you know and what you're okay well we're in a conservative republican household they're, they're christian they've got the the cross on the wall and they you know the family that prays together stays together is like the, the, the needlepoint mm -hmm. thing on the wall it's like all that stuff was in the script all that stuff was stuff that we discussed that kevin and yeah. i kevin greater and i discussed um and it was both by the way you said oh i you don't know if it's in the script or some of it is mine directly from the script and was always there and a lot of it is stuff that kind of comes out of meetings and, and and discussion and wanting to layer in some interesting stuff because the other thing about jackals that i think the 80s part of it we kind of we shot the movie in 2015 it didn't get released until 2017 yeah. we came we shot it so okay so all of the influences that people called me out on were not actually influences and we would then kind of called out on the 80s thing because everybody's like oh it's set in 1983 because stranger things is hot yeah. We didn't, Stranger Things didn't exist. We didn't know what Stranger Things, if you had walked up to us and said, you know, a time traveler from the future and said, hey, there's going to be this TV show on Netflix that's going to be the biggest thing in the world for like two years, three years, and it's set in the 80s and you have to, like, Jackals kind of leans away. We don't have big Aquanet hair. You could almost forget have, it is. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that was Kevin, Kevin Greuter, the director, um, kind of, because I had stuff, I had, I had, um, I wanted Chelsea Ricketts' character to have a Walkman at one point, mm -hmm. and um, to kind of drown out the 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 stuff that was the yelling and screaming that was going on. And um, there were these other kind of overt '80s yeah. references. And he was like, "No, nah, it's just not. distracts you. It takes you out of the That's being exactly there." It. He's like, there's, no. "There's a very intense, dramatic family drama going on that gets interrupted by extreme yeah. grisly Product horror." Product placement from the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, exactly. So like the 80s stuff is all just about like, oh, okay, that stereo is clearly from the 80s or oh, that that's, uh, you know, piece of equipment or oh, that they only had those that car or whatever. But yeah. it's not an in your face that 70s show Stranger Things mm. kind of thing where it's like, okay, the the era is all, you know, the era. Yeah. It's like, oh, they're playing Dragon's Lair. I know that. It's like we didn't want to do that. So it was interesting because I feel like we got cited for it. And on the one hand, it's like, well, maybe we should have just leaned into it more because it was popular at the time anyway. And then, yeah. you know, sometimes maybe when you it would have accused, helped. Maybe it would be, yeah, been maybe a it would have helped because yeah. the movie was not was not a big success. Um, but it was a small release anyway. Um, but it was something where it's like, okay, you know, let's we when you get accused of something like ripping off the strangers or yeah. making it basing it in the 80s because it's like well then i would almost rather be guilty of it if you're going to yeah. you know throw the should have done thing it should have thrown the right right, right, right. It, yeah and it was tough because again sacrilege got me a lot of meetings for remakes and a lot of the movies that i was being asked to come in and pitch on or to take a meeting on were things that i was paying homage to Mm. in jackals so it was really confusing you know it's like hills have eyes when i wrote there wasn't the hills have eyes you know it's like oh hills have eyes remake like oh well i guess i there's a lot of hills have eyes in jackals yeah um you know so it is it's one of those things where i like you said i took a lot of those influences and made my own thing out of it but it was in that era it was getting me meetings to then remake those things which was a very confusing 
identity crisis thing to kind of get into. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm still proud of that movie and, and really happy with how it came out. And I like that. I, I thank you for recognizing I mean, I mean, some of the stuff be. that we did. Try it to it really is. And, and it, it is for someone who's a fan of the genre, like for myself sitting there and not knowing what to expect, you know, I could feel, like I said, I could feel all the inspirations you named. Like, even if you hadn't yeah. sent me a list that these are my three people, right. like I would have watched that movie and gone like, Oh, Night Living Dead and this right. and this without it having to say, Hey, remember that? Remember that? Right. Remember that? Right. Um, look, I mean, I could talk about, I mean, Jack was alone. I could talk to you about all day long. Um, but I, I want to ask you a couple, I, I like to end these with a random round where I ask a couple quick questions and get your kind of gut reaction to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll kind of work through these. First, we talk about remakes. If you were given mm-hmm. the green light to remake any film, uh, what would you mm-hmm. choose and why? I have like multiple answers for this, and I've already kind of pushed your your time limit on this to pass the breaking point. Um, it's how would be the car? About, uh, George probably the car. <laughs> believe, believe it or not, it would be the car. It would be the 1977 movie, The Car, which is something that Ryan Turek really wants to remake. And, and you know... Uh, hey, actually, Ryan, remake The Car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. No, and he really wants to remake it. It was funny because they did that weirdo straight-to-video pseudo-sequel. It was 2000... It was re- not just recent. Well, last it, three or four years. Yeah. It's not that old. 2000... Um, so I was kind of... 16, maybe? I thought it was interesting that they made this, and it's like a death race kind of futuristic thing, and it was like, that's a weird choice to make a part two you know all these years for again a title and, no one knows <laughs> yeah you know but yeah it would definitely be the car because i have some well i just i have some really cool ideas for what i would do with a remake of the car um but i love that movie um and it's interesting because it's definitely like a cult thing it's mm-hmm. not it's a i you know and i'll probably get shit for this saying this but it's a guilty pleasure movie it's not an especially good film yeah but there are indelible things in it like the car itself and the way that it kind of operates like a shark mm. like a like a target almost like a like a slasher shark yeah, or like christine like kind of target same. yeah it's targeting people and, and doing its thing um and it's yeah it's a proto christine um and i like the idea of this demonically possessed car that can't be stopped and uh, in the small desert you know town where there's nowhere to run um, and so, uh, yeah, I think that would be it. I mean, I would, I would have, I have like seconds and third places, but I think the straight answer when you ask the question, the first immediate response is the car. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, who do you think is the most underrated filmmaker working today? Mm. Oh, wow. I don't even know. Um, all right. I'll say it. I have, I am working with someone right now who I think is, uh, Dave Parker, hmm. and oh, you, you don't know who he is. Uh, Dave Parker. I'm Dave thinking Parker. In my brain, all, like, uh, trying he, to. He's he. Well, first of all, okay. He, your audience right now would probably know him best from Tales of Halloween. Okay. Um, he did the first segment, the Sweet Tooth, which I thought was terrifying. Hmm. Um, but he directed a movie oh. called The Hills Run Red. Oh, The Hills Run Red. That is yes. a good movie. It's a good yeah. movie. It's really a good. great movie. And <clears throat> I don't know. And I know. So the thing is, is that there's a lot of us. My my crowd is, I mean, we have guys like Ryan and we have guys that are huge successes yeah. that have had runaway things. And, you know, the Darren Bousmans and the, and the Dennis Woodmeyers and, and Kevin Kulsh's, um, We're in that same crew and we all get together. But like, really, a lot of us are guys that just keep on keeping on. We keep on trying. We keep, I, I count myself among them. Where it's like we've been out here for I've been living in LA for 27 years and it's like my success level just now is kind of like where I kind of hoped it would have been 25 years ago rather than you know 27 years later um so like Dave is one of these guys he's so talented and he's got such amazing visual style he's great at scares he's great at getting great performances out of his actors he's really good with music his scores are always top notch um and his movies are incredibly good and incredibly watchable and he deserves <laughs> a franchise yeah they're brutal yeah. and and he deserves and i think you can immediately see like the guy that did hills run red and me putting our heads together and working on something it's like oh well, yes of course and i've known dave for like 25 years like i've known dave you know dave i've known ryan turk for 20 years hey, dave. Known dave. yeah seriously <laughs> yes no i mean Par- but parker's such a good guy and he's such a good director 
Um, I feel like he's, he's someone that I feel like, I don't know why Hollywood has not picked up on what he's thrown down because he is yeah. so good at what he does. And he's such a talented guy. And uh, we've talked many, many times over the years, but right now, again, we're actually actively talking about a project again. Um, so he's someone, Rebecca McKendry, who is my dead right horror trivia co-host. Yeah. Um, she's someone else that, <clears throat> and she did something else for sci-fi. She did the bring it on nice. horror movie that's coming up yeah. uh, uh, as well. So we both had this kind of new sci-fi that was coincidence, but, um, but Rebecca McKendry has a new movie that I've seen that hasn't, it's not finished yet, but I've seen mm-hmm. an early cut of it. Um, that uh, I can't. I think the title's changed actually from what it was originally, so I can't remember what it's called now. But she's it, it'll get a big blitz. It'll be, uh, but she's someone else that busts her ass and is yeah. really good at what she does. I don't even know what and, like where she finds time in the day when I listen I, to her. I like, ask her. We we yeah. have direct line. You know, no, we talk. I have to a four year old. I don't day. understand. Like that's a full time job. She's and got then two she's kids. Filmmaking, teaching, podcasting, horror like, trivia, and on it's podcasts like, all the yes. time. Yes. You know, yeah. 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 And I mean, we we talked about working on a project together. Together. It, it fell through. It was just one of those things where it didn't, didn't, you know, financing didn't happen. So it just kind of parted ways on it, but we still talk, we talk about doing, you know, we're, we do monthly horror trip together. Um, we were working on a podcast of our own that didn't happen. Um, mm. So, I mean, I don't know. And it's funny. Cause I just, I ask her all the time, where do you, how do you, how do you do it? Like, how do you, you know, yeah. and it's like, it's, it's almost, she's, she's kind of the person that will tell you, it's, it's almost like the wrong question. If, if it means something to you, then you're going to find the time and make how do you the time. not do it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's her answer. That's totally her answer. And so it's that it, you, you, it's, you have to kind of look inward to figure out the answer to that question, but she's great and she's really, really good. And this new movie that she's, that she's made, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say that I've seen it, but I, I saw a rough cut of it and wow, I was really blown away. Hmm. Um, but she did an anthology, a holiday anthology that she co-directed yeah. With David McKendry, with her husband, um, David McKendry is in uh, Tales from the Dead of Night Two, by the way, um, uh, coming soon at yearbuttheater.com. Um, and um, but um, uh, you know they did, uh, and I think they co-directed this one as well. But they did all the creatures restoring, which I showed up in. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting next to Axel Carolyn in a in a in a theater uh, uh, in, in an audience of a theater. We're across the aisle from Elric Kane, um, but Mike Mendez is in there. Mike Mendez is another guy that you know. i love and who i catch up with uh you know every couple of months yeah. and he, really he good popped friends. up in malignant actually and yes the, that's right that's awesome. right he's yeah. like the, yeah yeah he's like the super duper badass with the, the the case with the gun and oh it's so good um no mike's a great guy and but mike mike's always working mike's always getting where he yeah. just finished another feature so but still not quite uh getting you know he's not doing franchises and i don't know yeah. why that is i don't know what it is it's it's one of these mysterious questions when you're out in the in the industry. It's like we're still out there trying, we're still out yeah. there getting work, but you know, some of us get lucky breaks and and some of us don't, and some of us say the right thing at the right time, and some of us don't. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to say. So yeah, so my one most underrated is Dave Parker, but very soon after that, I would say Rebecca McKendry and then Mike Mendez. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, we obviously know Carpenter Romero what is a movie that your diehard fans would be surprised that you enjoy? So if there's something that's not necessarily horror, like I think George Romero with tales of of Hoffman or, you know, people have these kind of interesting takes, what would be a movie that you like love, you know, that people would be like, Oh, I can't believe that. (laughs) Um, Oh my God. Oh, that's such a tough one. Cause I mean, I have them, but wow. Um, I was thinking the other day about how big of a fan I am because I saw it on my shelf and I was like, Oh, I haven't watched that in a while, but I I really do love, um, there's a movie, (laughs) there's a George Clooney movie called one fine day. Okay. With George, George Clooney and Michelle Pfeiffer. Is it like, a? (laughs) a it's a romantic comedy. What's the genre? It's a romantic comedy. Oh, nice. It's, It's all set over the course of one day. Um, it's, it's George Clooney still figuring out, his kind of movie star stardom. Mm-hmm. He's not quite, he was on ER and he was making movies during yeah. the hiatus and he was still kind of figuring out what his, you know, he did Batman and Robin and he had some other movies where it was just like, wow, he still hasn't quite figured out what it wasn't until like out of sight. And then out of sight was like, Oh, Oh, okay. That's a George Clooney movie, you know, oceans 11. It's like, okay, yeah. now we know. Um, but uh, he made this romantic comedy. It's all set in one day. And he is a divorced uh, uh, father who is a reporter 
um, and he is um, he forgets that it's his day with his daughter, and who's a little girl. She's like seven or eight, and Michelle Pfeiffer is um, she works at like an advertising firm or a marketing firm, and they've got a huge meeting that day. He's got a big story breaking that day, and his source has decided to bail on him and is, is saying, I'm going to retract, I'm going to deny, you know? So he's trying to chase down this guy to get him to go on record again, to save his story. That's this big blowing the lid off of a, a conspiracy thing. And Michelle Pfeiffer has this huge meeting that she has to present for. And she's a single mom and the daycare has closed for some weird reason that they can't explain or that she misses the bus. To school. Something happens. So they ended up kind of, meeting each other and falling in love over the course of this ridiculous day um, where they keep on taking care of each other's kids and showing up for each other and doing all this stuff and having like 17 different meet cutes, you know? Um, and so I, I don't know, I, I'm sure there's some better answer because I do have a bunch of movies that are not, I mean, I, my, my, my interests are pretty varied when it comes to, to cinema. You know, I, I have a lot of movies that I love that, and they would be predictable things like Out of Sight or, or Batman yeah, sure. or Reservoir Dogs or, you know, any of Quentin Tarantino stuff, um, you know. But uh, so I have a pretty wide, varied, um, you know, whether it's Iron Giants, uh, which I yeah. love, or any of those movies, um, as much as the next guy. But uh, for some reason, when you ask, the movie that comes to mind is this obscure 20th Century Fox produced romantic comedy with George Clooney and Michelle Pfeiffer that was not a hit. It didn't, it yeah. wasn't even... It wasn't even like a big deal. It wasn't even like a big uh, uh, movie. I think it's from 96 or 97. No. Right around the same era as Mary Riley, which is another movie that I love that I think people would be <laughs> shocked. Yeah, I mean, that was like, but it's but it's in that era. It's in that weird. It's I, I, on Twitter a couple months ago. Somebody was like, someone needs to write a book about all of the classic horror characters that got reimaginings made in the 90s. Hmm. There's this starting with Bram Stoker's Dracula. Mm -hmm. There was this run. So you have Bram oh, Stoker's I Dracula. Love Frankenstein with Dana. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. The, so the, the, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there was Wolf. There was kind of Interview with the Vampire. You know, I'll throw it in there just because it kind of fits the, it fits the mold. There's Sleepy Hollow. Um, and there's Mary Riley. And it's a really interesting, mm -hmm. and there's more of them too. But it's this really weird little era where there were these yeah, I won't say hundred million dollar, but they were definitely in that range. Studio yeah. lavish, well, big budget. Yeah. Oh my god, awesome. gigantic! Yeah. Bram Stoker's Dracula is huge. Yeah. Um, but there were these lavish productions, and horror was in kind of a weird place at that point. It was kind of dead, you know, in quotes. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know what what is dead in horror is going to come back from the dead. So it was doing it was it was it was going to happen. It was going to come back. Um, but there's this whole era of kind of a list you know, studio, uh, you know, almost kind of above the genre, you know, elevated uh, movies that I, I I kind of love, even though they're a mm -hmm. little flawed, some of them. And Mary mm -hmm. Riley is probably the best, worst example. I just love that movie for some reason. Thinking about That's another one where it's like the music and the, the talent mm -hmm. involved. Like there's some magic pixie dust on that, on that movie uh, that I love. So yeah, so those would be my two. They're both 90s movies. I don't know what it is about. Lately, I've been on a, on a 90s kick. Yeah, I've been really I used to really stuff. dislike the 90s, but now I'm starting to find, maybe it's because I've watched everything else. So I'm like going to the 90s, but it is interesting. Like you're, I'm finding these gems where it's yeah, like, no. oh, these are really good. You know, I was, so again, in my 20s in the 90s. So I've totally given away my age at this point, but I was in my 20s in the 90s. Um, and uh, you know, horror really was. Fangoria was was struggling. They had to put things like that. Everything was Scream. T two on the cover, yeah, and, and then Scream kind of blew the doors off. Um, and you had the occasional Candyman. You had the occasional, uh, you know, Silence of the Lambs. You had the occasional big movie. But honestly, it was on, a yeah. break to video kind of graveyard. And I was kind of a snob at the time, and I was really into movies. I was really into, you know, like I said, cinema. Um, and so I was kind of way more into kind of the nihilistic, darker stuff mm -hmm. that was going on uh, in movies at that time. And so I wrote it off too. I wrote it off then and there. I wrote it off in the day. And so there were things like Leprechaun. There were things like the Puppet Master movies. There were things um, like, uh, you know, Night of the Scarecrow or any of these weird kind of franchise non-starters um, yeah. that I wrote off. And so what's been interesting in the Blu-ray era, the boutique label Blu-ray era, 
has been a lot of these companies kind of going back and doing these incredibly gorgeous restorations of mm. these movies that were, you know, straight to video. Um, and, you know, Amityville sequels from the 90s. And, um, and it's like, oh, okay, well, this isn't anywhere near as bad. Like, for some, A, I have nostalgia for the era now. Yeah. And B, like, they're better than I gave them credit for. Like, I don't know why I was so hard. I think it was just a snob. I was in my 20s. Yeah. And I thought I knew better than everybody else. Well, and they, I they were was, they this part of the term now is they are kind of kitschy, you know, like when you yeah. watch, um, you know, I know what you did last summer or when yeah. you watch, you know, um, even some of the screen sequels or even when you watch yeah. um, um, the one I'm thinking of right now is urban legend, you know, like yeah. urban legend, yeah. I could see at the time going to urban legend. I mean, like, oh, this is like a lower end, like kind of like when you go into certain Blumhouse movies yeah. that don't hit and you're just like right. oh, this, this is the trendy teen horror you know yeah. it just yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. land um, and i love blumhouse but you know like i, I sure. that feeling you get when you go to like would you rather you know you're like what in the yeah. world you know um i could see that with urban legend but now it's like fun being like that's michael rosenbaum like someone microwaved his dog right. you know and like there's right. you know, it's fun going to yes. that era and it's a time capsule that wears yeah. all of the time on its sleeve and it, it makes oh, it fun to watch Honestly, no. If you want one of those and you can't believe that you should watch it, you should watch I Still Know What You Did Last Summer. Is that the, because, is that the one where they go on the trip out of the country? Yes. That's a Brandy. really fun movie. Yeah. Yes. Same thing. It's a really fun movie. Really dumb, I mean, it's but so, so fun. trashy and dumb, but it's so entertaining. And that movie, cost, and it's funny because I remember thinking it was, it was a lot more expensive. And I had a friend that was like, no, no, no. Because I remember hearing it cost $70 million, but I think I looked it up and it really was like 30 mil, yeah. which is crazy. But the idea that they were making $30 million, I still I know, still know what you did last summer. summer. Yeah. With, but like Jack Black yeah. is in it. And yeah. um, uh, what's his name? Hawks. Oh, uh, Ethan Hawk? No, 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 no. Nope. Um, the other guy, oh. the guy from uh, the guy. Oh my God, this is terrible. I'm the horror trivia guy. I should know this. Um, but there's a there, the, the side cast. Jeffrey Combs is, and I still know what you did last summer. Oh, that's right. He plays the guy at the hotel. He's yes, the, that's right. The desk guy. Yeah, right, right, uh, right. Um, but so no, the, the cast in that movie is incredible. And uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt is oh, wow. like kind of in charge. Like she knows what she's doing. And that movie's really kind of exploitation y about leering John at the Hawks. camera, kind of leers at John her. Hawks. And John Hawks, John Hawks, from Dust Till Dawn. Fantastic yeah. actor. Um, yeah. 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 He plays Freddie Prince Jr.'s best buddy. <laughs> Um, and he's like a scene stealer. Like he comes in and yeah. steals the movie and Jack Black steals the movie and Jeffrey yeah. Combs steals the movie. Um, it's a fun, trashy, super gory movie mm-hmm. um, where, you know, at one point the killer tries to kill Jennifer Love Hewitt by locking her in a tanning bed and turning the knob yeah. uh, pre final destination yeah. uh, uh, at death. But it's a really dumb, fun movie, but it's, it's one of those where you just can't believe and like Jack Black, nobody knew who Jack Black was when that yeah. movie came out. He's playing like a you know stoner Rasta guy, stoner yeah. guy who's doing the whole Jamaica accent thing with the with the with the dreadlocks, and so it's kind of you know there's some appropriation there. So you've got to kind of you know yeah yeah time you're, capsule you're pulling on yeah. your collar. You're pulling on uh, your collar. I just saw it's perfect. It's like oh yeah maybe him <laughs> trying to do the whole Jamaican thing is not great, but it's like hey you know what it was 1998 and uh, and it was okay back then as far as you know white uh, studio movie uh, you know executives were concerned yeah. um but yeah that would be the fun one to check out uh, for That's sure awesome. but no but i but no i love those 90s things now it's weird to kind of go back and um i get into arguments with yeah. our guys my age where it's like i will go on twitter and be like hey i just got the blu-ray for pinocchio's revenge or whatever it is and they'll be like dude what are you doing you You're know like- don't don't tell people to watch you know that stuff and it's like, no, guys, like, this is fun. Like, okay, Jared, all right, sure, right. it's great because you're looking back on it with rose-colored glasses. But I enjoy those a lot now, and sure. it's fun. It's also because there's, like, a there's like a bottomless well of those yeah, to kind of so discover much, so and rediscover. Fun. Like, I'm going through Puppet Master right now, and it's, like, it's uh, fun just going it's fun. through that series yep. and shoestring, seeing the good, the bad, and the ugly. How far um, along into those are you? I am on six, which I just got six. through the Jeff Burr four and five, which yes. were actually like, these are good movies. Like It should just be one movie. In yeah. my opinion, I feel like they're both really short and they're both kind of like four is like half a story. So it's like, so I fun. feel like, but they're like, fun. They, they're so, so bizarre. Good. They're so fun. The huge yeah. plant, like planet ish alien weird demon set you know it's yep. like with the puppet yep. that like his mouth doesn't move but he's just kind of you know, like, oh, that's right that's right i can't like, think of his name but yeah the um, big the literal uh, puppet the demon 
though, and he's like yeah. standing up, and and when he gets up I, out of his throne, is walking around this set with all these little so ghost great. demon creatures. It's so weird. And they had it's so no fun money. and creative, it, yeah, and the lighting. And honestly, Puppet Master yeah. Five. Not to mm-hmm. go off on a long rabbit trail, but like <laughs> that movie, I was like, this has malignant energy. Like all that oh, yes. weird red yep. lighting, like the blood on the light bulb turns the lighting in the scene red. Like it's creative right. and yep. fun. Um, yep. Look, I, I'm going to ask you this last question okay. so my wife doesn't blast a shotgun hole through the door <laughs> and drag me out. Um, I got to ask this question. What's the one piece of advice you would give to an aspiring filmmaker? This show is called Film School. There's movies that mm-hmm. make you know who you are. But practical advice for this next generation of filmmakers, people that are looking and saying, I want to start making these movies. I want to start writing or directing or acting. Sure. What's the best piece of advice you'd give to them? I will tell you the secret. I will tell you what, 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 and it's, it's a dumb secret, but um, I will tell you what I figured out for myself uh, over time. And this is the secret that no one will tell you. Um, and the secret is don't quit. And it's a dumb secret. It's dumb that it is a secret, but what ends up happening is people and some people, you know, justifiably realize that it's not for them, that it's like they, they gave it their shot and it's, it's not something that, that they can do. Um, and some people just don't, you know, have it, whatever it is, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to, you know, gain it, that you're going to get better at it. You could keep writing scripts don't write one script and try to kind of, you know, Oh, here's my one script. Here's my one script that I spent five years working on. It's like, no, no. Okay. Finish that one. Then start writing another one Then start writing another one. But whatever you do, don't give up. Don't quit. If I had quit when it looked like, you know, I mean, I've been down more times than I've been up and here we are talking about this TV show that I wrote on that's premiering. Yeah. That's an adaptation of one of my all time favorite movies. Amazing, yeah. So it's like, you know, at some point I definitely should have given up, but I didn't. And, um, so it's tough because it is, it's a personal thing. It's definitely like, if you feel like you can't hack it anymore, it's, you've reached the end of your rope and you've, the rejection, uh, is too much. It's way too much. Like, when do I start getting to do things? Um, the thing is, it's a long term. it's a, it's a marathon and, and not a sprint and to, to just not, not quit. And I always say it's the dumbest secret of Hollywood that I can't believe is a secret, but it really is kind of uh, it's it's what I have kind of witnessed is that the the survivors are the ones the ones that stick mm-hmm. around. Now I'm enjoying myself. Like honestly, all the years of my 20s and 30s where I was just like, you know, why this? I would see a movie and go and I'd throw my hands up in the credits and go, why did this get made? But my things can't. And yeah. you know, every time I have those same and everybody does it. Everybody has those same complaints. And you get upset about you know watching something on TV or going to the movies and being like, God, like why? I'm, my stuff's better than this. I could do better than that. Keep proving that you can. Keep giving stuff to people to read uh, that you trust or that at least you know can help you in some fashion. Try to avoid getting scammed out of things. And just don't quit. Just keep going. Keep mm. keep moving forward because that's the only way that you're gonna that you're gonna make it. Because otherwise, this place, you know, Hollywood will just chew you up and spit you out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, thank you so much for you're welcome. so much of your time. And I could, again, seriously, I, I'd love to do this again and and talk through. Sure. I mean, a variety of rabbit trails we could go off on, uh, but I, <laughs> but um. I, like I said, I think the passion shows through. I'm really excited for anybody listening. I'm going to be dropping this on Monday, October 11th. So right. you have four days as of when this drops to prepare uh, for Day of the Dead. Um, yes. In the meantime, go watch Jackals. It's streaming on oh, uh, a couple different sites. and, and It's uh, on a bunch of things, yeah. Yeah, and, and, um, and- yeah, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Um, there's so many different places to catch yes. up with Jared's work. And uh, and also watch Love for Come Returns uh, before yeah, you watch well, no, Oh, yeah, series. absolutely. And, and, and Psycho Gorman, PG Psycho Gorman yeah. is so fantastic. Um, and I'm I, my website is jaredrivet.com, just like you know, the, the, it sounds. Um, j- at jaredrivet1 on Twitter. I'm scribejr on Instagram. And uh, keep an eye on um, uh, earbudtheater.com where uh, I have the upcoming horror anthology. It's an audio drama, uh, Tales from the Dead of Night 2, which is a sequel to my 2018 Tales from the Dead of Night. Uh, it's got Clark Wolf and Ben Begley and Rico Anderson and Larry Zerner from Friday the 13th Part 3. And uh, Dave, Dave McKendry is in it. Uh, so, yeah, keep your ears uh, open for that one. It's also on Apple Podcasts. It's totally free. It's not something you have to pay for. Uh, so, yeah, keep, keep, uh, keep your eyes open for that. 
Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, you guys have plenty of watching and listening to do over the next couple of days. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Film School Podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, don't forget to leave a five-star review and hit subscribe so you won't miss a single episode.